The Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material and questions for the record, subject to the length limitations in the rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address or contact full committee staff. As a reminder to members, please keep your video function on at all times, even when you are not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. Consistent with house rules, staff will only mute members as appropriate when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum and I now recognize myself for opening remarks. Pursuant to notice, we meet today to examine the ongoing atrocities being committed by the People's Republic of China against the Uyghurs and, the, uh, and other ethnic and religious minority groups in the Uyghur region of China. Since 2017, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and Karzis are members of other Muslim minority groups have undergone mass detention and seen their way of life threatened by China. As many as 1.8 million people have been arbitrarily detained in mass internment camps, prisons, and detention centers. They've been subject to forced labor, torture, political indoctrination, forced sterilizations and abortions, suppression of religious practices, family separation, sexual abuse, and other severe human rights abuses. Successive U.S. Secretaries of State have been clear that China is conducting a genocide against Uyghurs and other minorities. Many former camp detainees and people with family members that have been detained have spoken out, many at great risk to their personal safety and that of their families in China. They have provided firsthand accounts confirming China's targeted campaign of repression toward Muslim ethnic minorities. We are going to hear the harrowing story of one such person today, a brave advocate and survivor. Official Chinese statements and documents, satellite imagery, media reports, and other publicly available documents have revealed the horrific abuses inflicted upon Uyghurs and members of other ethnic and religious minority groups. And instead of working with the international community to investigate these atrocities and bring an end to the genocide, the Chinese government has endorsed a strategy of deflection and disinformation. It has labeled any attention to these grave human rights violations as lies and rumors, invoked baseless sanctions on organizations and individuals for their investigations into the atrocities, and has prevented and blocked processes for independent investigations into human rights violations. Last month, I was proud to introduce HR 317 alongside my friend and the ranking member of this committee, McCall, to condemn the genocide and crimes against humanity that are taking place in the Uyghur region. We called upon the Biden administration to direct the US permanent representative to the United Nations to urge the body to investigate the ongoing human rights violations and to invoke multilateral sanctions against China at the United Nations Security Council. Moreover, we moved legislation that ensures that the United States does not do business with institutions and entities that utilized forced labor in China. In doing so, we have demonstrated that defending human rights is a bipartisan priority. This body will continue to shed light on human rights violations, no matter the country involved, be it friend or foe. The United States has also taken action to hold accountable the government of the People's Republic of China for these atrocities and to punish those responsible for these detestable human rights violations. The Biden administration has implemented targeted sanctions against Chinese government officials over their continued human rights abuses in the Uyghur region. We must continue to work with our partners and allies in leading a coordinated effort against what is happening in the Uyghur region of China. We must send a clear message to urge the international community to stand united in condemning the horrific treatment 
of China's ethnic minorities. We also must put pressure on China to abide by its commitments as a signatory to the Genocide Convention and provide human rights monitors, researchers, and journalists unrestricted access to report on what is happening in the Uyghur region. And this should be done free from any interference. I now recognize the ranking member McCall of Texas for his opening remarks and praise him for working together to push this hearing today. Mr. McCall, you're now recognized for remarks. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing and thank you for working with me uh, on the resolution um, and just on this very important issue. Uh, I think the uh, eyes of the world are watching and certainly the Communist uh, Party of China is watching as we speak. Uh, the genocide against the Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party is a moral test of our time. There are a few other issues that demand this level of attention, not just from our own committee, but from the world. Elevating this issue is one of the key recommendations made by the China Task Force that I chaired, so I'm grateful that we can give it the bipartisan attention that it deserves. I'm also grateful, Mr. Chairman, that you joined with me to introduce and pass a resolution condemning this genocide and calling for action. When our resolution passes the House, it will ensure we are speaking in a, a united voice with the current and prior administrations by calling these ongoing atrocities genocide. Continuing this bipartisan effort will be essential as we respond to this crisis, and I thank you for being my partner on this issue. Genocide is a term that we reserve for history's most serious crimes against humanity. It is essential we get our response right, not as Republicans and Democrats, but as Americans, because we've faced this test before and we've always passed that test. Our response to the Uyghur genocide should be an example of our character rather than a stain on our history. This humanitarian crisis is about more than just U.S. foreign policy towards the People's Republic of China. It is about the legitimacy of the post-World War system designed to stop these atrocities whenever and wherever they are being committed. It is about how we stop the CCP from contaminating consumer supply chains with slave labor. It's about how we stop using cotton sourced from the Uyghur homeland and picked by those without a voice. And it is about how we convince our private sector to act consistently with American values after they developed a reliance on the PRC's consumer market over the last 40 years and as the United States attempted to bring China into the family of nations, but failed. That's why I'm disappointed our minority witness uh, declined our invitation uh, to join us this afternoon. I did invite uh, Nike Incorporated, an American company that's now struggling with the moral challenge many American companies face. Some analysts have claimed that Nike's supply chain is tainted by forced labor in China. Nike has publicly denied they source uh, from the Uyghur areas and have denied Uyghur forced labor exists in their factories. Uh, simply taking a stand against forced labor has exposed them to a massive boycott effort led by the CCP's online mouthpieces. However, we can assume that part of their decision process may have been likely the backlash from the CCP. And on the other end of the spectrum is Disney, which actually thanked the CCP propaganda office responsible for covering up the Uyghur genocide. And in the end credits what it in one of their mo most recent films, Mulan. And they actually filmed portions of the movie in the Xinjiang province. We cannot put profits ahead of doing what's right. And the American people need to hear from these companies doing business with the CCP, whether they're household names or, or who is just trying to do the right thing or their companies who shamelessly do the bidding of the CCP to maintain their market asset access, no matter what the moral cost is. The true nature of these Faustian deals need to come to light so consumers can begin to know where their money is going. And even though Nike has declined to join us today, we're still honored to be joined by an excellent panel of witnesses who use their voices to stand up for Uyghurs and other ethnic and religious minorities who are persecuted by the CCP. So I want to thank uh, you again, Mr. Chairman, for uh, your hard work in this effort. And thank you so much for holding this hearing. I yield back. 
Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. And thank you for your hard work in putting this together. It was a pleasure joining you on this important act uh, and moving forward, standing up to show the true values of, of America. Thank you. I'd now like to recognize the uh, Army Bearer, who is the chair of the Subcommittee on Asia and Pacific and Central Asia uh, and Nonproliferation for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and the ranking member. Again, this is uh, another area where this is not a partisan issue. You know, Democrats and Republicans coming together and all of us in Congress to speak with moral clarity on the importance in the 21st century that we can't let atrocities like what's happening to the Uyghur population um, occur in a vacuum. And we have to draw attention to this. So I'm, I'm quite pleased that, that um, the leadership that both of you have shown and the leadership that Congress has shown together. We now have to work with um, the, the, the rest of the world, our partners in, in the European Union, other like-minded nations to elevate this conversation. We also have to work with the Islamic majority countries to highlight the atrocities so that the, the public in those countries understand what's happening to, to the Uyghur culture, their religion, um, and, and atrocities. So I look forward to working with both of you, the full committee, my partner, um, the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, to address these issues and move them forward. So thank you again for holding this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, Chair Barra. I now recognize the subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, uh, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as the ranking member of the uh, Asia Pacific subcommittee and past chair of that committee, um, I've been following the Chinese Communist Party uh, and what they're up to uh, very closely for many years now. And the barbaric repression that they're committing against the uh, Uyghurs is truly horrific and despicable. Words really don't do justice to the crimes that we, the whole world, are witnessing uh, today. Last month, we passed a resolution introduced by Ranking Member McCall and yourself, Mr. Chairman, uh, calling the atrocities what they are. Uh, genocide, um, forced sterilization, involuntary marriage, uh, family separations are the order of the day there. Uh, this hearing is particularly important because the CCP routinely attempts to cover up its malevolent actions. Um, we must take every opportunity to draw attention to the murders, the countless rapes, the brutal torture, and the Orwellian surveillance of innocent Uyghur civilians. Unless we use our power to draw attention uh, to these and countless other atrocities and then hold their perpetrators accountable, no one else will. So thank you for holding this hearing on yield back. Thank you, Mr. Shabbat. I'll now introduce our witnesses. Ms. Tusi Nai Zia Wudun, who is here interpreter, Dr. Elise Anderson. Ms. Tusunai is a survivor of the Chinese government's extra legal arbitrary detention centers in the Uyghur region and an outspoken advocate for Uyghur human rights. In November 2016, she was detained for more than a year in total in two different camps. She was released from the camps in December of 2018 and was granted special parole to enter the United States in September of 2020. As one of the very few survivors of the camps who has reached safety in another country, she has provided testimony to human rights groups, researchers, and journalists investigating the Chinese government's crimes against Uyghurs and other Turk Muslim peoples. Next, we have Dr. James A. Millwood, who is a professor of intersocietal history at the Wall School of Foreign, Affairs, Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He also teaches at the East Asia Program at the University of Grenada in Spain. Throughout his career, Dr. Millwood has specialized in the Queek Empire, the Silk Road, Eurasian Lutes and Music and History, Historical and Contemporary Xijiang, Uyghurs and other Xijiang indigenous peoples, and PRC ethnicity policy. The Honorable Nure Turkle is the chair of the board of directors at the Uyghur Human Rights Project. As the first US educated Uyghur American lawyer, 
He's a foreign policy expert and human rights advocate. He was born in a re-education camp at the height of China's tumultuous cultural revolution and spent the first several months of his life in detention with his mother. He came to the United States in 1995 as a student and was later granted asylum by the US government. Without objection, all witnesses prepared testimony will be made part of the record. And I will now recognize the witnesses for five minutes each to summarize their testimony. So first I go and yield to Ms. Tusinai Ziya Wudun. You're now recognized for five minutes. Assalamu alaikum, Hamama. It's Mandel Salam. Mandel Salam. I've been in the Mansharta for a long time. All the Shahri Kunas Naya the Bulme. Man Kunas Naya. Okay. You come to know. Does a lager the Yatran, Shai Bush to the Mulan? Fishing with this day. Zatkam <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Hello to all of you. My name is Tursunay Ziyawudun. I am from Kunes County, Ghulja City, East Turkestan. I am speaking to you today as a survivor who spent time in a concentration camp in Kunes. Thank you to the US government for giving me this opportunity to tell you about my experience. I thank all of you. Because I do not know English, Ms. Elise is going to tell you about what happened to me. I feel that I must speak up as a survivor for all those who have not survived. I'm not asking for sympathy for myself. I am asking governments around the world to wake up. The world should not allow genocide to continue in the 21st century. I grew up in East Turkestan. My husband and I moved to Kazakhstan in 2010. The Kazakhstan government granted residency to my husband, who is of Kazakh ethnicity, but my application was rejected. Because my Chinese passport was expiring, I returned to my hometown in November 2016. Border officials questioned me. Why did I go to Kazakhstan? Had I been in contact with anyone from the US? One month later, the authorities confiscated our passports, and a few months after that, I was sent to a camp. The conditions were terrible and filthy. We were told we had problems with our ideology and would receive education. If we asked questions, we were beaten. Because of my health condition, I was released after around one month. The second time I was sent to a camp was far worse. It has left an unforgettable scar on my heart. I was taken on March 8, 2018, and kept there for more than 10 months. Buses would arrive every day with more detainees. It was very overcrowded. There was a bucket in the corner for a toilet. There were cameras watching us inside the cell, and we were always hungry. Each meal was a watery soup and a bun. We were given injections of unknown medications. Every day, we had to endlessly swear loyalty to the Chinese government and reject our faith. We had to watch endless videos about Xi Jinping. Girls would be taken away and only brought back days later. I saw girls lose their sanity because of it. And then I myself was taken, along with another woman. I was tortured with an electric stick pushed inside my genital tract. 
I could hear the other woman's screams in the next room. I knew the guards were raping her. After that, she never stopped crying. One time an order came. All the women had to be sterilized or fitted with an IUD. Many young women were crying, screaming when they were told they would be sterilized and could never have children. I left the camp in December 2018. Before my release, the officials warned me if I spoke about my experience, there would be heavy consequences. I still did not feel free. One day I saw a former cellmate. She had survived, but she was dead inside, completely finished by the rapes. The government's goal is to destroy everyone, and everybody knows it. In September 2019, I was allowed to leave for Kazakhstan. I told my story to a Kazakh human rights group and to journalists, but I was still afraid of the Chinese government. There was a suspicious fire at our house, and the Chinese police would call me and threaten me. It was only after I came to the U.S. last year that I decided I could tell the full story of what happened to me. I knew that I might not be believed. I knew that some people would consider that my honor was tarnished. But with the support of my husband, I took my courage in my hands and told the truth to BBC reporters. The story was aired on February 2nd. The story sent a shockwave around the world. But Uyghurs and Kazakhs thanked me for speaking out. They couldn't stop their tears as they thought about their sisters and daughters and what they might be suffering. We cried together. The Chinese government reacted by smearing me and the other survivors who testified about sexual abuse, even a culture of rape in the camps. At a press conference in Beijing, the foreign ministry spokesman held up my photo and called me a liar. I want to thank the United States for giving me safe haven. Without your help, I would still be a stateless refugee, still fearing that the Chinese government could force me back to China. Now you have my testimony. I ask you to take action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, for that testimony. I now turn to uh, James uh, Melwood. You're now recognized for five minutes, Dr. Melwood. Dr. Millwood, you may have to unmute. Yes, thank you. Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member McCall, and distinguished members of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, thank you for inviting me to testify about this critical issue. I would like to mention at the outset that insofar as I have any expertise to offer, acquiring it has been generously supported by Title VI, Fulbright Hayes, the Woodrow Wilson Center, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and by the University of Arizona, where I taught in the early 1990s. Federal and state public funding has been and remains critical to building and maintaining U.S. knowledge about China. When it came to power and took control of Xinjiang in 1949, the PRC found itself ruling over the diverse peoples of a former empire, the Qing Empire. Like the Soviet Union, another socialist state controlling a former empire, the Han, for the Han-dominated Chinese Communist Party to exercise power over indigenous peoples in Xinjiang, Tibet, Mongolia and elsewhere, presented both a practical and an image problem. How to rule over a former empire without being an imperialist or looking like a colonialist yourself. The PRC thus implemented a modified version of the Soviet nationalities policies, recognizing 56 ethnic groups, including the Han. It also created so-called autonomous regions, including the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, and many so-called autonomous prefectures and counties. The officially recognized ethnic groups and supposedly self-governing ethnic territorial units comprise what we may call the PRC's diversity management system. Now, this original diversity management system supported language, education, and cultural expression of each non-Han group. In theory, and at times in practice, it protected non-Han groups from discrimination and cultural erasure by the Han majority and assured each official ethnic group some representation within the authoritarian government and party. While very different from the diversity management systems of liberal democracies, this first generation PRC diversity system, when honestly implemented, proved popular among non-Han people. 
One might even say that in the 1950s, non-Han people in China were, as regards racial discrimination and violence, better off than blacks and other persons of color in Jim Crow America. The Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 70s was a horrific exception, but not Han groups in the PRC look back to the 1980s as a relative golden age of PRC diversity policies. Since 2013, however, General Secretary Xi Jinping has embarked on a radical revision of the PRC diversity system. He has moved the bureaucracies dealing with ethnicity and religion out of the government and under the direct control of the party's United Front Department. He announced in 2014 that problems in Xinjiang would require attention not just to material measures, that is economic development, but also to psychological issues, a framing that led to the program of so-called concentrated educational transformation in prison-like facilities for over a million people and the imprisonment of hundreds of thousands more. He also launched a campaign to sinicize religion in China. Xi Jinping promote promotes an idealized homogeneous Chinese identity labeled Zhonghua as a centerpiece of his China dream. A current Chinese political catchphrase calls on the party to grasp firmly the forging of a Zhonghua collective consciousness as the main political line. This notion of Zhonghua is meant to be a kind of super ethnicity encompassing all the others, but the word Zhonghua itself is composed of two Chinese characters that each individually mean Chinese. And in practice, the characteristics of Zhonghua are indistinguishable from those of Han. This state promotion of Zhonghua identity, then, is a top-down effort to Hanize or Sinicize non-Han ethnic groups in China. The phrase, the phrase forging collective Zhonghua consciousness reminds us of a metaphor we now seldom use in the United States, the melting pot. The Chinese Communist Party, however, substitutes for the melting pot a blast furnace directed at the indigenous peoples of Xinjiang. This industrial strength metaphor chosen by the party itself aptly sums up the physical coercion and cultural violence of the concrete policies inflicted upon Xinjiang indigenous peoples since 2017, which has been well documented in the work of numerous researchers, journalists, and US government investigations. My colleague, Nuri Turkel, uh, will, will present several recommendations, which I'll just simply say that I endorse. And to end, finally, let me say that further targeted sanctions and shaming of responsible parties are warranted and should be undertaken in collaboration with other nations. It is crucial, however, that we pursue these efforts without indulging in broad brush demonization of China or Chinese people generally. The root of the problem lies with the policies of the CCP in Xinjiang and the CCP's abandonment of its own previous multiculturalism. The United States cannot deliver a message calling for cultural tolerance if it sounds or acts culturally intolerant itself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melwood. I now recognize Mr. Nuri Turkle for five minutes. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member McCall, and honorable members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify on behalf of the Uyghur Human Rights Project, uh, commonly known as UHRP, at this critically important hearing. This is my fourth time uh, testifying in Congress in the past three years on the same issue. I truly appreciate your leadership in prioritizing this issue. I want to highlight a new phase in the Chinese government's genocide, uh, genocidal policy against the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims in my ancestral homeland. UHRP has warned for more than three years that the end goal of this policy is the destruction of Uyghur culture, traditions, language, and faith. Simply put, Chinese state has criminalized being Uyghur. The Chinese state has spent the last four years crushing our culture, language, civ civilizational uh, accomplishment uh, in poetry, literature, the arts, and theology, architecture, and scholarship. The Uyghur imams, religious scholars, university presidents, professors, and teachers, successful business owners, entrepreneurs, they have all been swept in mass, en masse into the modern day industrial scale concentration camps. 
in many cases, the entire families have disappeared. Very soon, anything that can be described as Uyghur in our homeland will be an empty shell, a Potemkin show. This is already a reality given the lackluster international response to this staggering 21st century high-tech genocide. I want to emphasize that genocide denial is in full swing. China's government is not only implementing a brutal policy of state violence, causing immeasurable human suffering, it is also demanding that the world phrase its policy. In a way, CCP is trying to normalize its state violence against a vulnerable ethnic and religious community. The CCP now is producing a daily stream of statement, videos claiming that it deserves praise for helping Uyghur life, quote, a happy life, unquote. The government goes even further. It forces Uyghurs to participate in genocide denial. Officials are forcing them to dance and sign for the cameras to show how happy they are. The dozens of Uyghurs have been forced to make videos denouncing their relatives abroad, including our fellow Americans, for speaking up for their uh, freedom. In February, UHRP released a report on this cruel propaganda, forcing Uyghurs to say scripted lines such as, quote, the government never oppresses us, unquote. The government is also turning out aggressive propaganda campaign against global, uh, against global campaign to end state-imposed forced labor in the Uyghur region. The latest effort was government manufactures boycott by Chinese consumers against foreign brands to defend the so-called Xinjiang cotton. One video in this campaign showed Uyghurs dressed in traditional performance costumes holding a floppy ball of cotton in each hand dancing and singing song phrase of Xinjiang cotton. It is just sickening. In the short time I have left, I'd like to raise several policy recommendations. I urged Congress to act quickly to pass Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which your committee marked up on April 21. Uh, thank you so much for your leadership on that. The Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act designates Uyghurs as a P2 refugees. This urgently needed to save Uyghurs who are at risk of refoulement in multiple countries. The United States should also urge every signatory of the Genocide Convention to fulfill their obligations under Article 1, the obligation to prevent genocides, and even without making a legal atrocity crimes determination, Article 1 obliges states to take an action to prevent an unfolding genocide. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I also hope you will ensure that American Olympic athletes are not forced to compete in the shadow of the concentration camps at the 2022 Olympics in Beijing. The United States should coordinate with like-minded countries to ensure that the 2022 games do not take place in Beijing as long as atrocity crimes continue. The United States can and should do more to prevent Silicon Valley and the U.S. universities from cooperating with CCP or CCP-funded companies selling the so-called Muslim tracking facial recognition system being used in this high-tech genocide. I provided several other policy recommendations in my written statement that I would be happy to address them later. In closing, I'd like to thank this committee again for the opportunity to testify and uh, for your commitment to end the ongoing genocide. Uh, I, I, I'm profoundly grateful and thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you. And I want to thank each and every one of you for your testimony this morning, this afternoon. I'm now going to recognize members for five minutes each pursuant to the House rules. And all time yielded is for the purposes of questioning our witnesses. I will recognize members by committee seniority, alternating between Democrats and Republicans. If you miss your turn, please let our staff know and we will come back to you. If you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally and identify yourself so that we know who is speaking. I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Ms. Tusine, let me 
just say to you first, your testimony, which hit me deeply. Uh, no human being should ever have to go under the, hor the horrific treatment that you did. I thank you so much for testifying today and for your bravery and candor in sharing your story to expose the PRC's horrendous treatment of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities. And this is especially true because Chinese authorities have prevented journalists and researchers and people on the ground from doing so. And so it's so significantly important that we, the members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, were able to hear from your lips your experiences. And I was really horrified when you said that even when you were allowed to leave and were uh, in Kazakhstan, and to the degree even here in the United States, that you are afraid of the long reach of the PRC government and the extraterritorial threats and harassment that you have faced from the Chinese authorities while on foreign soil after you left China. So the first thing I'm trying to find out is, number one, has anyone from the PRC tried to contact you or harass you or do anything while you've been here in the United States? And if so, how can the United States and other governments better protect Uyghurs abroad, wherever they may be? It's Tuesday. today. Uh Tursunai Hanum Gasol. A Tursunai Hanum Govachlup uh as the edge per in son uh Chuan Muam Lara Uchun Sab Bulate uh Guvah Lorangasdin uh Rahmatamni eight men sisga uh Mushiagikilip Ahtainang Sisgaboran Muamalasne Posh Kalish Kalishanazga in Tayan Rahmatan Bilderman. And then Sisden Suraidran Brinchi Soalim Bosa Sis Amr Kagandin Buyan Ahtainang Adam Dari Sisbelan Allah Kalish Pakanabamo. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you to you as well. Thank you for listening to what I had to say and to listening to what is happening to an ethnic group um, that is being treated so horribly. Uh, when I was in Kazakhstan, they called me regularly and threatened me but they have not done so since I came to the United States, nor have I attempted to contact them. And then, Torsnais is din so rather on Ishkinchi so alum bosa America, Hukimete, Honda Kulganda, Uyula, that Bashka Turkey, Millet, Chat Elder Turvatan, Uyula, that Bashka Turkey, Milletin Bolgan Adam Lenny. I'm not, my apologies, I'm not quite sure how to answer such a political question. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and again, uh, I just want to thank you for your testimony. Uh, I will take it with me uh, forever. Uh, understanding the atrocities that have taken place around the world 
it is harmful to the human race for this still to be taking place in 2021. And, and it's indeed very important for every human being, less known members of the United States Congress, uh, we will make sure that your story gets out and we will not sit back and allow it to continue without the United States uh, working with other uh, international countries to speak out loudly and clearly so that the genocide uh, and the, and the, and the uh, uh, abuse uh, uh, to uh, people simply because of their religion or ethnicity, uh, that cannot take place and we will work to make sure we stop that out. Slagged on the Tersh Tershan look, cursed the Slanakolaska. Yanabel Katam Rahmatimni, Damon Sisgak of Achlopaganska. So now I go to Mr. Turkle or Mr. Millwood. You know, hearing that story really has got me. I'm, I'm just really quite upset. And, and even though I knew it, hearing it, you know, if you're a human being, gets to your very gut and has gotten to me. Uh, let, let, let me ask, in coordination with the United States, the UK and, and maybe Canada, the European Union, you know, I know in March uh, we imposed sanction on four Chinese officials in Shenzhen, uh, the Public Security Bureau over human rights abuses. And as a response, China sanctioned four entities and 10 European lawmakers and diplomats and their families. What, what, what is a sustainable and effective strategy for the imposition of sanctions when faced with baseless retaliation by the PRC? And what can the U.S. government do to protect individuals and organizations that speak out against these human rights violations from Chinese retaliatory measures? Mr. Turkle or Mr. Miller? Thank you, thank you Chairman. Um, that's a great question. Uh, when we talk about the targeted sanction, oftentimes uh, uh, you hear a pushback saying oh, this may not be an effective method. Uh, the China is, is a big country. Uh, they may not, you may not be able to create a dent um, uh, and force them to change their behavior. But based on the recent uh, Washington Post article, uh, one of the uh, major suppliers of yarn uh, complain about losing about hundred million dollars in one year simply because of the US companies canceling out uh, contracts. That shows that our strategy is working. So the, the sanction, uh, the currently there have been 74 punitive sanctions have been announced uh, including 52 uh, entity list designation, uh, global Magnitsky sanction against uh, XPCC, Xinjiang uh, Production Construction Corp which is a paramilitary, uh, reportedly uh, owns or manages 800,000 shell companies around the world, largely responsible for the ongoing cotton trade, uh, the enslavement of the Uyghurs. So we are on the right track, but this has, this has to be expanded. I agree with uh, Dr. Milward that naming shaming in dealing with, uh, with communist China, the leadership works. They care about two things. One, how they're being portrayed in public, we're doing exactly that. Uh, as a result, European uh, parliamentarians, including my two commissioners at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, been sanctioned uh, in addition to members of Congress, former uh, Trump officials, uh, senior officials, including uh, Secretary Pompeo. Uh, it shows that our message is being heard in Beijing. Uh, so we need to continue to call them out publicly. And then two, uh, as I uh, stated in my testimony, we need to focus on uh, China's economic interest. Uh, the export and the technology. Uh, I participated uh, in study uh, researching the export volume to the United States. This has been reported by multiple organizations, but namely uh, Center for Strategic International Studies reported that uh, during the period of April 2019 through April 2022, Xinjiang, Xinjiang exports to the United States increased nearly by 250%. That shows the magnitude of the problem that we're dealing with. So we need to expand uh, our practice, uh, the ongoing uh, pressure on the businesses. And as we speak, as you well know, the U.S. Thank Chamber you. of I Commerce. I'll cut you off because my time has expired. I want to make Thank sure you. I get to any members. So uh, I now uh, will go to questions uh, and ask uh, and, and yield to Ranking Member McCall for any questions that he may have. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to thank Ms. Tersene for her powerful testimony. As you, Mr. Chairman, I was also very uh, moved by her, uh, her um, personal experience, but also her courage and bravery to speak out and speak out the truth, even though the threat from the CCP is very real. So, Ms. Tersene, I just had a question for you. Uh, can you explain to members of this committee why the CCP views the Uyghur Muslim culture and religion um, such a threat that it would open up concentration camps and commit these uh, horrific acts of genocide? <laughs> چو اخشاش این داین تاسود لندم سزنان جسور دقیقن از دن این داین تاسود لندم مینان سزن سورای دقیقن سوالم بو پارتیا نیمش که اویغولانن مدنیتنی اویغولانن دننی نیمش که اویغولانن مدنیتی و دنی دن شم دا قای دقیقن دو بونی بر چند روب بیره لیسیز مو من مو رحمتی تماس لگه یعنی در قسم اونو که گندم من مو اشتاق تشنه می قلمه اونو یاده اشتاق و حقیق اشتاق در زنان دنم ازدن و یغرلا در قوق نشتا مسلک هیس قلده اتا خطای حکومتنان اشت جزا لگرده من بوغا وقتم با هر بره بزنان اشت اشتاق در قولم ازده اشتاق در مرسی یوق اشتاق در کامل نا اشتاق نتی ساخشلا قرال لب پیمر اوی نا اشتاق در تغام موسا خمو بزن اول برخیل آنقدر خوکان دیگر اش نداک معامله کرد قرار لک کربیت نداک بزن بیشتر میوه خونم از اش دک معاصر بود بزن بزن بزن نیست فقط در دنیا دن میوه خونش بیان دک بر اش دک خریدت لک کرد بودی کن نمیشن چی نمیم نیمو بو بزن اول مس اویا خوکانش دک اش کند اش کمایم اول اگه اش کند دک بر اویورلا اش کند دک بر قانون سوز اش کمایم لیکن بو بر دنیا اکثر وقت خان تهدید تب اولی مادی. فقط لقوق بمس اولیغرلا دن لقوق یا که اولیغرلا بر قیام دیده تب اول میده. چون بو بتن دنیا اکثر وقت خان تهدید اولیغرلا آرگل خدا تب اولی مادی. بزیم و شون دوام نخ میام از پیدا اشت لگن آشت. I also want to say thank you to you. Similarly, I also don't exactly understand why, but they truly seem to feel that we are terrifying. Um, in the time when I was in the concentration camp, we had nothing on our persons. The police had weapons, and still they treated us like we were terrifying. And it, it seems to me like they just want to get rid of us from this earth. I, I don't understand, uh, but, but this really is a threat to the whole world. And I think that they are sending this threat to the world through what they are doing to Uyghurs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tersne. I mean, the CCP officials uh, has, has said um, openly, you, can, you can't uproot all the weeds hidden among the crops in the field one by one. You need to spray chemicals to kill them all. Um, if that doesn't speak to genocide, I don't. I don't know what does, um, Mr. Um, Mr. Turkle. I wanted to ask you about your family. I understand you still have family in the Xinjiang province. Um, how their well-being is, and uh, uh, have they or you received threats from the CCP uh, for your service? Thank you very much for asking uh, that question. I, I came to the United States uh, 26 years ago. Of those 26 years, I was only able to spend 11 months with my parents, uh, you know, my background, uh, the way that I was brought to this world. Um, I, I, I, uh, half of my life, my parents were missing. Um, and it's simply because CCP, they don't allow my parents to come to spend the rest of their time, whatever the time they left in this world. Uh, my, both of my parents are experiencing uh, a serious health issues. They have five American grandchildren, two American sons, and yet the CCP is preventing them to leave. Because of my prominence in the Uyghur human rights work, I've been dealing with on and off, on and off threats. 
But what is most egregious is that since I was I've been appointed as a commissioner to the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, their pressure has been stepped up. Uh, I have been unsuccessful uh, in my attempts to uh, get my parents out of China uh, to take them to hospital to provide a proper care. That is not happening. I've been trying to reunite with my family since 2009, unsuccessfully. And final question. Um, I think the naming and shaming is a great idea. The targeted sanctions economic on those profiting off slave labor and concentration camps. Um, as we look at towards the Olympics, um, um, I think there will be a diplomatic boycott, um, but I believe the corporate sponsors will still be involved. And I, I think there needs to be some sort of corporate responsibility here. Can you or, and Mr. Millwood perhaps speak to uh, what we could do in the Congress to instill uh, this corporate responsibility um, as the Olympics, if, if and when they go forward? I'll speak briefly to that, if I may. Uh, um, first of all, thank you, um, uh, Mr. McCall, for that for that question. Um, I think, you know, in the past, a lot of people have looked at the Olympic issue and looked back at the um, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and have said that the boycott was not useful. Um, I think it was useful. I think we need to use the opportunity, though, to have as many conversations to bring corporations into it to bring the athletes themselves to spread the message rather than being a single uh, up and down decision made, for example, by the president. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think we wouldn't, um, if we boycotted Munich uh, during the Nazi regime, uh, we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have seen Jesse Owens uh, prove to Hitler that uh, his Aryan race was not uh, superior. Um, and I don't know if, if boycotting the Russian, I do think the athletes, uh, uh, deserve their time, but I, I think this corporate responsibility notion needs to be, um, any ideas you have moving forward, I would love to hear those. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, thank, you thank you. I now recognize Representative Brad Sherman of California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and continuing the efforts of our committee to focus on the genocide of the Uyghurs. Uh, we had a, uh, a hearing on this in December of 2019 when I chaired the Asia subcommittee. I commend to those who are watching this hearing to go back and look at the transcript of that one. In that hearing, we heard uh, from Mr. Farrakhat uh, Jadat, uh, whose mother, um, and he spoke so eloquently, well, was in detention for 15 months. The um, issue before us is, uh, what should we do? Uh, so far, we have passed uh, through the House and Senate only some modest acts that are aimed at particular individuals. Uh, often, this is a way to make us feel like we've done something by denying tourist visas and uh, to people who don't want to visit the United States and, and freezing the U.S. assets of individuals who don't have assets in the United States. We came close in 2019 to passing more significant legislation, uh, which was the Uyghur Act. Uh, I had introduced the Uyghur Act, but this was actually a Rubio's bill, which we in our committee uh, used to put a lot of House content in it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, having passed the uh, Senate, uh, having passed the House, the Senate refused to deal with it. Ultimately though, Focusing just on individual people or individual products is probably not going to get the Chinese government to change that much. It does contribute to our sense of purity. So we can say no American lips have touched um, a slave picked tomato from, uh, from uh, uh, uh, Xinjiang, but uh, uh, it just just not being able to sell certain tomatoes in the United States is not gonna get Beijing to change its behavior. To change its behavior, what we need is across the board tariffs on all Chinese goods. And this will give us the bargaining power we need to deal with China on a host of issues, especially human rights. And it will also reduce Chinese power, which is very substantial here in the United States, 
China has that power because we're so dependent upon them in our supply chains. Um, as we've talked so much about the plight of the Uyghurs and uh, um, uh, I've been, I think the testimony has been illuminating, but I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Turkle about the policy of, of, of Muslim states around the world. Here you have a Muslim group being oppressed in large part because of their religion. And uh, the government of Turkey has at least said a few things under some pressure from Turkic nationalists in Turkey, but virtually the entire rest of the Muslim world uh, has been silent. Uh, what can we do uh, to get the Muslim world to be hopefully even tougher on this than we are? What can we do to get the Muslim street around the world to appreciate that whether it's Kosovo, Bosnia, uh, the Rohingya or the Uyghurs, it is the United States that has played the greatest role in the world in trying to protect uh, this uh, uh, oppressed uh, Muslims. So what do we do to both galvanize support uh, in Muslim countries for your cause? And what do we do to make sure that Muslims around the world know uh, that the United States has taken the lead? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, as you may recall, we had this conversation uh, in our first hearing uh, back in 2018, uh, September 2018. It's incredible we having the, we're discussing the same issue without much progress. It's very disturbing, uh, to say the least, um, that uh, the Muslim majority countries uh, have taken a side with CCP, even uh, in the face of CCP calling Uyghur Islam as a mental illness. Uh, the countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, Egypt taken a, a given a full support in fact they're publicly phrasing uh, ccp for its treatment of the muslim uyghurs yeah we can talk about economic uh, uh reasons but if more so it appears that they found a common ground uh you know covering each other's back uh, these countries are not a jeffersonian democracy but we can just ignore them for the for a while but there are few other countries have been in the mildest manner, speaking at the Turkish Minister of Foreign Affairs, for example, uh, uh, Kosovo signed a joint letter after the ministerial, and also Qatar withdrew a support of that uh, letter, 39 country letter that they submitted to the UN Human Rights Council. So there's some, uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, plainly, if I can put it plainly, countries are doing a better job uh, rallying support within these countries. So I think diplomatic effort would be very effective. So we can start this with the Organization of Islamic Conference. Uh, this administration is doing exactly the right thing, engaging with our, our partners and allies. Uh, and this should be taken to the UN. Uh, the, the, we Let have me, a, uh, last year, we didn't have- expired. So i uh, got to get the rest of the members. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I now recognize Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, and global human rights for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and especially for holding this important hearing. You know, Mr. Chairman, as you know, since 1983, I have raised the issue of the one child, now two child per couple policy, which has been used with devastating impact on women and children in all of China uh, with forced abortion and forced sterilization as its means of implementing uh, the one or two child per couple policy. Now we see, uh, and this has been around for a while, it's not new, but the whole idea of coercive population control is being used against the Uyghurs. And uh, Mr. Turkle, you pointed out uh, some very devastating numbers that say that 84% of the birth uh, rate has, or the, the uh, population has dropped by 84% between 2015 and 2018 and 24% in 2019. Uh, I have worked with many individuals uh, uh, inside of Xinjiang uh, with regards to this issue for years. Uh, this is a form, it's one of the definitions of the Genocide Convention, Article 2, there's five of them. One of them is imposing measures intended to, rent, to prevent births within a group. All five of the, of the, of the criteria for the Genocide Convention um, are being, violated by the PRC, by, Xing, by um, uh, Xi Jinping uh, with impunity. 
And uh, I just want to ask a couple of questions of Mr. Turkle, if you would. Uh, and first of all, thank you for making uh, the Forced Labor Prevention Act introduced by Mr. McGovern and I uh, your first priority, at least listed number one, because I think as my colleagues know, and you marked it up in committee the other day, Mr. Chairman, uh, it would create a rebuttable presumption that all goods produced in the region are made with forced labor unless U.S. Customs and Border Protection certifies by clear and convincing evidence that goods were not produced with forced labor. So it shifts the whole presumption. Uh, these products will not come here unless they can prove uh, that they were not made with forced labor. But if I could, if you could speak to this issue of this horrible issue of coercing women, uh, of stealing their babies and destroying them by dismemberment or chemical poisoning, uh, which is an outrage uh, and more needs to be done. Secondly, on the, you say that the, in the United Nations, the U.S. should bring the issue to the U.N. Security Council, and you ask the Biden administration to do that. Uh, have you had any feedback as to whether or not they will? They also say that uh, the U.S. should urge the U.N. Human Rights Council uh, to go beyond um, the fruitless demand for an international delegation to have access um, to just do remote monitoring. We know what's going on. We want more information, but they're going to deny access until the cows come home. And finally, on the Genocide Olympics, I'm going to be chairing a hearing probably on the 18th uh, on the Genocide Olympics uh, with the Tom Lantos uh, Human Rights Commission. And, uh, you know, it seems to me uh, that the change of venue uh, is still a viable option if there is the political will. And again, as, as my friend Mr. Call, as the ranking member mentioned, the fact that corporate America is going to be aiding and abetting um, an Olympics in a, at a venue where there is a current day genocide occurring, plus other massive human rights violations, uh, is absolutely unconscionable. So if you could, Mr. Turkle, speak to those issues. Thank you very much. Um, the forced sterilization uh, population uh, control is one of the most effective methods or practices in a genocidal campaign. Uh, the family planning policy has been uh, enforced, as you well aware, uh, from your hearings from the mid-90s, uh, late 90s even, that uh, th this is an ongoing process, but it's only uh, uh, accelerated in the last few years based on the Chinese government's own report. So why do they do this? Uh, they wanted to prevent the Uyghurs to exist, exist in, in, on the face of the earth. I recently had a chance to interview one of the former camp uh, uh, employees, a teachers. She said she told me that she was forced to go through sterilization at the age of 50. So this is, this is outrageous. This should be, I don't think that there's a, a mechanism to address this. Maybe Congress should consider looking to the way to handle this uh, legislatively or through a legislative mandate. On the Olympic issue, I think it's not unusual uh, for Olympic Committee to consider postponing the uh, next year's Olympic if relocation turned out to be a difficult proposition. It is unfair to our athletes, American athletes, to compete uh, while the genocide is ongoing and in the backdrop of the concentration camps. And also, let's be reminded of the history. In 1936, when Hitler held the Berlin Olympics, he was already built Dachau. He was engaging in forced sterilization. He was engaging in forced labor. And three years later, he invaded Europe. Should be con concerned about China may following a similar practice. Um, we can sense impatience in Beijing to achieve the global ambition. So this should be concerning. We can leave aside, put aside all the human rights concern, but this can be a geopolitical national security concern for the United States. Thank you. Okay. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now will recognize Representative Jerry Connolly of Virginia, who's the president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly uh, for five minutes, after which I will pass the gavel to the vice chair of the committee, Mr. Tom Melanowski. Uh, and as I have to leave, I just want again to thank the witnesses, especially Ms. Tusine, for her very, very uh, moving uh, and, and, and bold uh, testimony uh, here today. It is something that I will long remember uh, even past my time here in, in Congress. Thank you, and Mr. Connolly, you're now recognized for five minutes. I think you have to unmute, Mr. Connolly.
You're still on mute, Mr. Connolly. You have to unmute. Samantha, we probably we look like we're having technical problems. Let's come back to Mr. Connolly. Let's now go to Representative Ted Deutsch of Florida, who's the chair of the subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and Global Counterterrorism. And we'll see if we can get back to Mr. Connolly. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Meeks. Thanks for convening this really important hearing. Thanks to our witnesses for testifying this afternoon. Uh, for years, the government of the People's Republic of China has used uh, false pre uh, pretexts to repress and discriminate against the Turkic Muslims and other minority groups, particularly the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Uyghur, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, uh, and to harass members of these groups uh, located uh, in other countries. Reports describe a systematic program by the PRC government involving the arbitrary detention of more than a million Uyghurs, as well as torture beatings, food deprivation, sexual assault, forced sterilization, denial of political, religious, cultural, and linguistic freedoms, so much of which we've heard about powerfully uh, from our witnesses today. Congress has taken important action to assist Uyghurs, including uh, passing Representative McGovern's Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which sanctions PRC officials for resp uh, responsible for the repression of Uyghurs. And I'm proud to have supported this and other, member, uh, other measures. However, more needs to be done. Uh, that's why I introduced the Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act in March to provide priority to P2 refugee status to Uyghurs and other minority groups facing persecution by the PRC government. P2 is for groups of special humanitarian concern who are designated for resettlement processing and provided direct access to the US refugee system. The bill also streamlines the asylum process for Uyghurs encourages allies and partners to also accept Uyghur refugees and encourages the Secretary of State to prioritize the plight of the Uyghurs in bilateral relations with, with third countries that host Uyghurs. Legislation demonstrates con congressional interest in assisting the Uyghur people and signals support for the Biden administration's efforts to aid Uyghurs and others persecuted by the PRC. The bill has received bipartisan support, and I'd like to thank my colleague, Representative Smith, for introducing it with me, and thank the half dozen other members of the committee who have already agreed to co-sponsor. For centuries, the United States has had a proud history of welcoming oppressed peoples from around the world. We are right to focus on actions within China. The Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act is a continuation of the best tradition of U.S. foreign policy and humanitarianism and upholds America's image of a beacon as a beacon of hope and refuge and liberty to millions worldwide. So I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and other members of this committee to advance this bill and provide additional support for Uyghurs. Now, Mr. Turkle, in your written testimony, you express support for providing P2 status to Uyghurs and expediting Uyghur asylum cases. Can you Please describe the barriers that Uyghurs face, both in immigrating to and declaring asylum in the United States. Congressman, thank you so much for uh, introducing that bill. I, I thought it was, it was uh, necessary and, and a critically important bill. Uh, the humanitarian intervention is something that we could do uh, while the diplomatic engagements and activities are ongoing. Uh, there are two uh, major challenges uh, for the Uyghur refugees around the world. In the homeland, uh, there are heavy uh, backlog uh, being created since 2013, preventing affirmative asylum applicants to go through the adjudication process, uh, simply showing up at the asylum office to have a hearing, uh, asylum interview. We can work to expedite that. Uh, the Uyghurs are not asking for blanket immigration status. They like to have a day uh, with the asylum officer to tell their story why they cannot be returned to China in the face of the ongoing genocide. Uh, on the other countries, particularly in the Middle East, uh, Turkey to be exact, um, there are a large number of Uyghurs have been uh, wandering and hiding because most of the host countries have a derogatory information on them. They also collaborate with the Chinese state, uh, namely countries like Egypt, uh, UAE, uh, have uh, deported uh, 
uh, Uyghurs uh, who are seeking or facing a danger in, in the country. So the ideal way of uh, handling this issue once we have the legislation is to set up a independent mechanism, uh, either at the state, uh, uh, at the embassy, or through an NGO to go through independent uh, uh, vetting process so that we can avoid that uh, derogatory information provided by CCP to those host countries being used against them. Uh, Mr. Turkle, thank you so much. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, there is so much that we can do through this legislation and the ongoing focus of this committee. Uh, I'm grateful for your attention, the ranking member's attention and leadership of both of you uh, on this vital issue. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Deutsch. Uh, Representative Chabot is next for five minutes. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and my good friend and colleague, Mr. Sherman, uh, raised a question already that I wanted to focus on, but I'll expand it a little bit. Um, and, and, and I'll go to Dr. Uh, uh, Millward and then uh, back to Mr. Turkle on it, if he had anything he might add. And that's the frustration uh, that, that I feel, and I think many of my colleagues, uh, with the, uh, you know, the Muslim countries across the globe uh, who basically have stood by silently or sometimes uh, even even worse, uh, as Mr. Uh, Turkle mentioned, uh, and either they're cowed by the PRC or they're afraid of uh, their reach or their economic power or, or something it keeps them quiet on one of the most horrific human rights abuses on earth uh, today. What, if anything, can either we or our allies or others do uh, to, uh, to modify the way they are looking at this uh, and, and, and uh, actually step up and, and help us? It seems the U.S. is out there, unfortunately, too often alone on these issues with some of these other countries that we're supporting in many other uh, ways and have helped them so much are just silent on something that they ought to be aggressively uh, speaking out on. And, and, uh, so, uh, Dr. Millward, could, could you comment on that? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think the U.S., although the measures that we've been taking now are, are a very good good step, we were a little bit slow, um, really a, at least a year slow in our own in our own responses to the atrocities in, in Xinjiang region. Uh, the recent work with our allies in, in Europe, Canada, UK, I think it's a very, very positive step because it's presenting an international uh, uh, uh, view of what's going on as opposed to simply it being a bilateral U.S. response. Um, I think this kind of diplomatic work can be extended to beyond traditional NATO allies to other countries. Um, there was that list which Mr. Turkel referred to of signatories of a letter in the U.N. of 37 other countries. That list included many Muslim majority countries indeed, but it also included many countries that are not Muslim either. And the issue here I think is much more that of authoritarian countries, countries with, own, with their own very bad human rights records, uh, uh, signing on with China uh, and forming sort of a block, an authoritarian block in the UN Human Rights Council, for example. So I think more UN involvement, excuse me, more US involvement in the UN getting back onto the Human Rights Council there and continued diplomatic work. Um, there were some Muslim countries that did not sign that letter. Malaysia did not sign that letter. Bangladesh did not sign that letter. Um, and so there are some possibilities that we can work with. Turkey, I did not in fact sign it, although their you know, position on this is, is complicated. So there are many opportunities, I think, for gaining Muslim countries uh, agreement on this. The country of Qatar initially signed and then unsigned that letter with the authoritarian government. So progress can be made. It will take diplomatic work, perhaps quiet diplomatic work, maybe some guarantees that the U.S. is going to stand up for this and not and not waver ourselves. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tukel, did you want to comment any further? Yes. Um, we need a bigger boat, Congressman. Uh, the, this should not be the only matter, uh, the matter for the United States government only to consider a concern. Uh, the, uh, our traditional allies and partners uh, start coming along, but we need to do, we can do a better job in Central Eastern European countries, uh, some countries that Dr. Millward was mentioning, 
I used to be fighting against the same fight that the Uyghurs have been fighting, communism. So yeah, they, we, have, we have to engage and we have to uh, deepen the public engagement, uh, public diplomacy particularly. Uh, using the local population uh, would be very uh, useful. Like, for example, in, um, in Europe, if our embassy organizes uh, the victims as camp survivors to meet with their own government uh, and engage them, that may be helping them to get on board. Personal contact can be very powerful, as, as we have seen uh, through tonight's testimony today. So uh, our embassies could arrange that kind of meeting with the local governments. The Uyghurs, for, um, Uyghurs have some problem. Uh, try not to engage with the governments uh, in their host countries. The same thing in Australia, same thing in Germany. So if, if our embassy could help them to set up that kind of contact with their governments uh, could help us to bring them on fold, in the, in the fold. Thank you very much. Uh, my time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go to Representative Barra for five minutes now. Great, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, and thank you for this important hearing. Uh, I'm gonna follow the line of questioning that my colleague from California, Mr. Sherman, um, initially started, which is um, how do we engage the uh, Muslim majority countries um, in, in this fight? And you know, I understand that a lot of those governments are certainly authoritar authoritarian and um, limit the flow of information, but it's always occurred to me that if the citizens in these companies, if the countries, if the young people in these countries understood what was happening, that mosques are being torn down, that, you know, um, people's religion are, are being reprogrammed and, and the, the, the um, internment camps, that you could mobilize the, the masses to then, you know, get their um, get various governments engaged. Maybe, Mr. Um, Kirkel, this is a question to you. Within many of these Muslim majority countries, how aware are the, the citizens, the young people in, in the countries of what's going on in Xinjiang? I think um, uh, because of, I, it, there's one key issue that we have to tackle, that is disinformation. Some reason, uh, the Chinese have been very effective uh, uh, misinforming the public and the Muslim countries. To this day, they are actively telling the world that this is a problem that the United States made in order to prevent China rise. So disinformation, um, we need to tackle the disinformation campaign that the Chinese have been waging. And also we have to recognize that these Muslim countries, uh, the citizens don't have a voice in these kind of matters. They cannot go and criticize their governments. For example, this is impossible, even Egypt in, in Saudi Arabia, for their citizens to say, oh, you, you should not take a side with CCP. So I think the diplomatic engagement, uh, public diplomacy, uh, engaging uh, with, uh, with those countries individually uh, or collectively could be very helpful. We can pick a few candidate countries. I think um, people have a, may have a different uh, view, but Turkey could be a good candidate country that we should engage. Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, they have a large Muslim population. They're also facing certain type of uh, CCP threat. So should it be, we should engage with the government uh, a one-on-one -on -one and high level uh, instead of making public statements. I think that could be something very useful. In the previous administration, uh, Secretary Pompeo went to Central Asia uh, to engage with the Central Asian and Turkic states. Uh, Secretary Blinken could do, uh, should do the same, uh, engaging with uh, people who has historic, historical traditional ties with so, the Uyghurs. So what, one of our best strategies in the Cold War was Radio Free Europe. And you know, the, the beauty of it was we didn't have to, we were just telling the truth and, and making sure people had access to the truth. So, yeah, I don't know if there's ways through social media, um, you know, because recently I was reading an article in the New York Times about you know, some of the Uyghur population in, in Japan and when the Japanese public was starting to become aware of what was happening in, in China, um, they started to, to raise the issue with their government, you know, probably in a way that the Japanese government didn't necessarily want, want raised, but, you know, again, I think that the, the the population in Europe now is very aware, which puts pressure on the EU and you know, countries like France and Germany not to move ahead so easily with some of these trade deals. And you know, again, maybe it is forming a coalition of like-minded, like-valued countries, um, getting the citizens engaged, places where you can you know, um, make access to information more readily available. And 
then putting pressure on the, on the UN. So having that coalition, maybe, um, you know, Ms. Uh, Dr. Miller, Miller, if you want to add anything to, to how we might create that global coalition in my last minute. I don't have much to add to what um, Mr. Turkel just, just said. Um, this is, of course, a, a difficult, not something that can be easily done by a single passage of a bill or something, but, you know, um, restoring the United States' own international reputation and various and human rights issues and so on. This is an ongoing process that involves uh, issues at home as well as issues abroad and looking at our own uh, history in the Middle East. But insofar as we can take some steps and send some signals around those things, uh, I think it can only help in our in, in, in, uh, in being more persuasive in our conversations with Muslim majority countries uh, in this discussion about China's uh, treatment of the Uyghurs and other peoples in Xinjiang. Great. I'm, I'm out of time, so I'll, I will yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go now to Representative Burchett for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is very informative. There's a lady in my district that she's always on me about why haven't I done anything about the Uyghurs and I, the situation with the communist Chinese and I'm as frustrated as she is. I'm frustrated as a committee and I worry about the things that we're doing. If we're doing anything at all, just another report on a, on a shelf. And I'm wondering um, with the administration, they seem to want to co uh, cooperate with the Chinese Communist Party in various aspects, especially the environment. And uh, I'm wondering, do you think it's smart for us to cooperate with the Chinese Communist Party in this respect um, while condemning their human rights violations? And does any of, the, of, our, of our guests feel like this can be separated? Because everybody seems to want to play ball with them, and I just and I and I get it, but I'm I'm curious of what our our panel thinks. Well, I'll I'll try to address that. Um, I, Richard, I understand your your frustration and you know, the idea of playing ball with a regime that is doing what it's doing in Xinjiang is a very difficult one. Um, in my written testimony, I was playing around how to suggest we think about this. And I came up with the phrase of um, you know, compartmentalizing when necessary, but do not minimize or marginalize human rights issues. Uh, and I'm, and I'm you know, sure I'm telling you and others in the US government you know, something you already know by saying this. That's how you know, politics is done, and that's how we do things. But uh, with, with environmental issues, we are facing global problems, um, and it's also an economic problem. And there are, is the ironic issue that much of the uh, polysilicate, I believe it's called, which is used to make solar uh, solar panels, you know, actually is sourced in Xinjiang. Um, so I'm not sure if polysilicate will become the next cotton or tomato. Um, but the point is, um, we are all really linked together economically. Uh, just as we are linked together morally with these problems. And uh, we need to be talking about them and be pushing on them. Um, and insofar as we can agree on something and have some conversations going on over the environment, and recent signals have been a little more positive that, that the uh, PRC and U.S. can work on some of that, uh, that can only make it easier to address the more thorny issues at the same time. Um, so although it does involve, you know, keeping contradictory ideas in our minds simultaneously, uh, I, at least from my point of view, as someone who has conversations with Chinese colleagues and friends about this all the time, um, it's important to have some common ground, um, maybe to retreat to now and then, um, and so then we get out onto the, you know, the, the, the rhetorical battlefield at other times and really work on the more difficult issues. I uh, just think too much we're listening to the Chamber of Commerce and maybe we need to listen to our hearts a little more. Um, that almighty dollar seems to be the driving factor in all of this for us anyway. Um, you know, and going back on what you said, though, it's easier to prevent uh, imports coming in from Xinjiang, but there's a report that 80,000 Uyghurs have been transferred and forced to work in factories in other Chinese provinces. 
And, uh, you know, what can we do to improve that supply chain tracing? I mean, this is a joke. You know, if we, we put it on one province, but we don't put it on the whole, oh, but that's not that, that's not the whole country, Birch. You know, and I get that. But there again, are we going to, when are we going to start listening to our hearts instead of the chambers of commerce? Mm. Here, may I actually, here I will agree with you. It's definitely not just Xinjiang, it is the whole country. And I mentioned in my written, uh, my written testimony, uh, there's a, a program in China known as the Partnership Pairing Program or the Counterpart Pairing Program, which actually created sister city relationships between provinces and cities of eastern China, rich provinces and cities, uh, to go into Xinjiang and build factories and build industrial zones and provide educational training. And there are news reports that some of this, in fact, is directly involved with the uh, with the gulag, with the system of prisons. So I think we need to expand our uh, our ambit and what we're looking at uh, to see what is the involvement of Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and all of the others in what's going on in Xinjiang. Um, and that will, of course, create more pain, um, but it will also create more, more pressure. And, and so I would very much agree with you, Representative Burchett. Yeah, I'm out, we're out of time. I just remind everybody every time you buy something made in china there's probably been slaves hands on it and i think we need to start we need to start acting appropriately and acting like a world leader and, um, and put the greed aside for a little while thank you mr chairman i appreciate this your time and your indulgence here here um representative titus uh will uh, go to you for five minutes now Yes, thank you. Uh, I met recently with some members of the National People's Congress. It was a, arranged by the U.S. Asia Institute. And when I mentioned the Uyghurs, there was kind of two responses. One was, of course, they denied that they were committing any kind of genocide and, in fact, insisted it was just the opposite that they had rooted out terrorist plots. They had eliminated poverty. They were giving the Uyghurs a real opportunity for a better life. And then the second argument they made was that it was really none of our business. This was internal politics of China. We didn't need to get involved in it. We had our own problems with how we treated minorities in this country. So I would ask the witnesses if they would comment about this and talk about the fact that as we do draw more attention to the problem, considering sanctions or getting some of our allies in the area to condemn it. Are we running the risk of driving this underground and making it more difficult to get good information about what's happening so we can't be effective in countering it? I can start. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Um, for the first time, uh, Washington Post in the last 20 years has no reporter in China. Even if we go soft and hard on China, uh, on CCP, I don't think it make any difference. They don't even want to acknowledge mm -hmm. that they are dragging the international community to, to engage with this genocidal regime in a daylight. They also have no shame uh, referencing the Holocaust when they're talking about collective punishment. They also have no shame using their money, uh, economic influence to buy out silence or turning some weaker countries into a client state. They also have no shame uh, stating that the United States made some mistakes in the 19th century, therefore U.S. has no moral authority to speak. Mm -hmm. So th th when, when, when a government or even individual had nothing to say, they call others liars and uh, play a whataboutism card. So that specifically addresses the, why the, the Chinese have been uh, coming out and engaging in this. And also genocide denial is a very active method for the perpetrators to continue the campaign. So the longer that they can uh, confuse people, conflate the fact, and also using some useful, excuse me, for using the useful Id idiots in our country from mm -hmm. academia, from the think tank to take, uh, criticize our, our government that is injected into the Chinese official propaganda helps the regime in Beijing. Beijing. Therefore, this, we have to be very mindful. This regime is extremely in, uh, insecure, as has been displayed in Alaska. They have very specific objective, both domestically and internationally, that they wanted to create new norm. They have expanding the technology that they used to engage in genocide over 80 countries. We have much bigger problem to deal with. 
As I pointed out earlier, the United States remains to be the largest destination for Xinjiang exports as we speak. Mm -hmm. So we, the, the, it took us almost 20 years to get this problem. It takes even longer probably. Even it requires more innovative, creative, uh, bold uh, responses to tackle these monumental challenges that we're facing. Well, thank you. I, I was afraid of something like that. I would ask Ms. Tursune, uh, if that's uh, pronouncing it correctly, uh, thank you for your courage and being with us today. Uh, I would, would like to ask if she could comment about the Uyghur community that's outside of China, that's looking over its shoulder, worrying about being repatriated. Is there any special targeting or harassment or problems uh, particular to women and girls that you know about who are uh, facing those kinds of issues? Uh, Asızlığın bilişinizce bu Hıhtay'nın sırtıdaki uyğulanın arası da məxsus kız ayarlığa karıltılığan təhdit siliş ya ki bulması başka kontrol kılıçta. Aşında işler bu mu bilişinizce? Bilmedim. Kandak uyğulanın arası da uyğulanın arası düşünüştük bunu. I, I am going to re-explain the question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Uyghur kız ayallığa məxsus, məsələn, bir çarı qolu nəb, ya ki, başqa bir usullanı qolu nəb, məxsus kız ayallığa qarıtıdığan bir təxdid silişdə, aşındaq hərəkətlər var mı? Vətən sırtıda deyilməz mi? Vətən sırtı bu, müşəxla turbat qalan dəmsiz, aşı vətən nəxsiz. Çət, çət əldə. I do not know of any such things. Uh, so I don't know of anything outside, but back in the homeland, um, even outside the camps, mm -hmm. there are such threats that are specifically targeted at girls and women. So I was living outside the camp for nine months. And in that period, there were all sorts of threats. People from the government, police um, would come around, would call all the time. They forced us to drink alcohol and so forth. At the end of 2019, those things were still going on, but I didn't see any such things after I went to Kazakhstan. Okay. Well, other than, mm, just other, than other than by telephone. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we will now go to Representative Barr. Representative uh, thank Barr. you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you to our witnesses. And um, as to this re absurd uh, moral equivalency argument about uh, the United States and our history uh, relative to what's happening in, in, in Xinjiang, uh, I will just uh, say for the record, and I shouldn't have to, uh, that the United States is not, and the United States government is not operating concentration camps. Uh, not engaged in extrajudicial detention, collective punishment, guilt by association, systematic torture and rape, medications inducing infertility, impaired mental function, torture, rape, uh, uh, forced abortion, withholding medical care, intense political indoctrination. This is not happening 
in the United States. And so um, uh, it, it's it's a shame we have to say that for the record, uh, but but this is just absurd propaganda from the CCP. Um, let me ask any of our witnesses. Well, actually, let me start with um, Professor Millward uh, and Mr. Turkel. Um, tell me, is there what is it about the Uyghur population that is that creates such a sense of threat to the CCP? Why why is the CCP so particularly threatened by the Uyghur? Well, the the, the Uyghur region or the so-called uh, the the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, um, you know, it, it lies outside of traditional China demographically and geographically, and was really you know, um, taken over by the People's Republic of China in 1949. Now, of course, this historical arguments about previous Chinese states being involved there, and you know, it becomes a historical question. Uh, but essentially, it's it's a colonial issue that they have not wanted to recognize, and instead instead tried to argue um, through false historical narratives that the place has always been part of China. And now they've come to the extreme point where they're arguing that the people of the Uyghurs, the Uyghurs themselves, are historically Chinese, although they don't know it. <laughs> That's essentially what this, this argument has been. And so they've gotten themselves into this extreme position. Um, there's a lot of Islamophobia around this as well, and, and fear and, and lack of knowledge of who the Uyghurs are because their customs are very different from those of, of Han Chinese, and this fear of, of, of difference is part of that as well. And so we see policies such as were mentioned by uh, Zia um, you know, forcing them to drink alcohol or putting pressure on students or officials not to fast during Ramadan, um, concerns about, you know, pork. Um, Precisely those aspects of Uyghur culture that are different from the Han make many people uncomfortable in China, and so they've been they've been they've been targeted by these policies. Okay, let me let me ask um, any of the witnesses. Um, obviously, President Biden has appointed uh, John Kerry as special envoy for climate to dialogue with the Chinese regarding climate change. Uh, this action obviously shows uh, uh, that climate is a priority for the administration. Uh, the special envoy Kerry went to China to negotiate with the CCP. Uh, President Biden convened a climate summit, invited President Xi to speak at that summit. Uh, has the Biden administration taken any similar steps to stop, stop the CCP from continuing to commit genocide against its own people? Has President Biden convened a summit to stop the genocide? Have we sent an envoy to China specifically regarding genocide in Xinjiang? Um, what actions have, has the Biden administration taken uh, that would put this issue uh, in any remote vicinity of the priority that that the administration is is placing on climate. The, um, let me tackle that question. Um, the Uyghur uh, Uyghur genocide, and now reportedly connected to the uh, uh, green technology, green investment that the Americans are making in China, particularly the solar, solar panels. Uh, Uyghur's homeland also uh, reportedly the largest base for windmill turbine. So I, th I think it's reasonable to expect that uh, the, the Biden administration uh, bring up these issues because it's been already reported. Congress is also uh, going after these issues. Uh, recently, Senator Rubio wrote to the uh, organization represents solar industry. So they have been put on notice. Uh, as far as the administration's specific actions, they announced two coordinated uh, sanctions uh, last month. Uh, we are particularly pleased with uh, Secretary Blinken's engagement with our allies and partners. As a result, uh, we have three parliaments at least now, Canadian, UK, and uh, the Netherlands, have officially recognized. Uh, we anticipate similar action in other countries. Uh, maybe Australia uh, and others in Europe. So, so the, uh, and one other thing that this administration don't write is to raise this and if, literally every public event I've been hearing uh, uh, Secretary Blinken uh, bringing up this issue uh, repeatedly. So this, this is very important, especially publicly calling them out. Uh, the, uh, the, what other additional steps taken? Um, you know, I could ambitiously uh, recommend Secretary Blinken to visit, request to visit the Uyghur homeland. This has never happened in the history. That is possible. If the Chinese had nothing to hide, open the doors to Secretary Blinken. 
a, a good idea. My time has expired, but I want, I, I hope uh, this administration or any administration to uh, place emphasis on this issue independent of climate and not just where slave labor converges with solar uh, panels. I think this is an independently important issue that should be a priority for the administration. And, and I am encouraged with your testimony and I hope that continues. I yield back. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Connolly, are you uh, are you ready to jump in? I am. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, thank you for our panel. I'm sorry I've had to go back and forth. I have three uh, Zoom hearings at the same time. Um, and Mr. Turkle, just picking up on what I heard, I mean, I find it interesting that there'd even be an inferential criticism of the Biden administration with respect to calling out the Uyghur human rights crisis, given the fact that the previous administration, and led by the president himself, almost never talked about human rights, uh, avoided it in his conversations with people like Vladimir Putin uh, and uh, other venues. Uh, and, and in the brief few months, the Biden administration has been in power uh, what I understood from your testimony, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, please clarify uh, if I got it wrong, but I mean, this administration actually has brought up the weaker human rights crisis in every exchange, public or private, with the Chinese that we know of, including uh, Secretary Blinken's meeting with his Chinese counterparts in Alaska. Is that correct? Yes, um, that's that's accurate statement. Um, the, the one um, uh, specific uh, actions, uh, if you will, that the Biden administration is taking is to continuancy of the policy initiatives or the, uh, the executive actions put in place in previous administration. As I noted, uh, there are 74 punitive actions uh, they've been, that have been taken, uh, which is very significant. I've been doing human rights work in the last 22 years. I, I never thought that my government will, will be taking such a significant action to uh, address these issues. I'm sorry, let me just interrupt you. You said there were 74 specific actions taken. Yeah, punitive right? actions taken punitive by the United actions. Yeah. By the Biden, yeah. This is by the Biden administration. No, the whole uh, previous and current, current administration. By the United States. Together. Yes. And, and one other thing that I think that uh, Secretary Blinken or President himself should consider doing is a whole day, a friend of uh, Uyghur's uh, summit. Uh, at least uh, taking the issue to G7 uh, summit next month and in the UK. And this has to be tackled on a really high level. Mentioning it publicly, raising it is wonderful, but a tangible, uh, long-lasting uh, actions are required. We need to expand uh, the existing policies being implemented. Let, let me ask you, do you believe that the United States policy could or should be more specific uh, on on items with respect to the suppression of the Uyghurs, like closing detention camps, ending family separation, and birth uh, suppression policies, among others. I mean, yeah. is there benefit in our being more specific in calling out Chinese reprehensible actions? Absolutely. Um, your constituents, for example, uh, in Northern Virginia, have been separated from their family members. Uh, several uh, uh, Uyghur Americans who are either uh, uh, working for the U.S. government uh, as a contractors, looking for family members. The Biden administration at least tried, tried to specifically help the Uyghur Americans to reunite uh, with their grandmothers, grandparents, or siblings. That should be something that put on the top of the agenda. I, I could even go even further. The, the Biden administration should not have a engage, uh, should not have a meaningful dialogue on anything until at least the Uyghur American families being released from the concentration camps. We heard from Mr. Millward that, uh, and, and by the way, Mr. Millward, I agree with you, and I, I think it reflects uh, on the Chinese actions in Tibet as well. There's a, a certain Han uh, xenophobia within China about other ethnic groups and the need to dominate. Um, and unfortunately, they're willing to resort to very violent and repressive practices to do that. Um, did you want to elaborate a little bit, Mr. Turkle, and Mr. Millwood's observation? I'm, I'm including Tibet. Mr. Millwood did not, but I think he probably would agree. I see him shaking his head. Yes. Uh, about this, this impulse 
in the Chinese culture, with the Communist Party promoting it, um, to dominate and repress other ethnic groups in the country. Could Mr. I, Turco. I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Millward, if you wanted to comment, of course. Very quickly, it's not within Chinese culture, and uh, it's it's within the current policies of the PRC, and I, and I, I think that's important because... I'm, I'm sorry, I want to be real clear. I didn't mean to say Chinese culture as such. I meant the communist culture of China, current China. Current, current political culture, yes. The Congressman, I... Uh, no country uh, in the world uh, treats the Muslims the way that the China does. Uh, this question came up a few times earlier. The, um, to the Chinese government, the others, particularly the people who follow Western religion, could potentially pose a political threat. So that's, that threatens their sense of insecurity. This is why they've been primarily targeting Muslim and Christian population in the current uh, crisis or state violence against the vulnerable uh, minorities. Time has expired, I'm afraid. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Congressman uh, Stoibe next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a member of the Africa, uh, my questions are for uh, Mr. Turkle. As a member of the Africa Global Health and Global Human Rights Committee, I would like to touch on China's role in Africa and how, how this relationship can lead to detrimental outcomes to human rights. Chinese companies have been constructed or renovated or both at least 186 sensitive African government buildings. Burundi inaugurated a 22 million presidential palace. Zimbabwe has a 100 million parliament building. The Liberian government is expanding its capital building. The 66 million combined cost of the project equals more than 2% of Liberia's estimated 2019 GDP. All the buildings and many more across the continent were gifts from the Chinese government. One of the most appealing gifts Beijing offers African officials is help maintaining power. Chinese infrastructure projects often happen around their election season. Chinese companies are well suited to provide a political boost, but because they can move quickly in part because many are willing to forego environmental impact studies or ignore la local labor laws. Many African rulers will likely side with Beijing over Washington on key issues and in international settings like the United Nations. African states comprise nearly half of the 37 signatories of a 2019 open letter defending China's human rights abuses of its minority Uyghur population. I introduced a resolution condemning the United Nations decision to appoint China a seat on its Human Rights Council on April 1st, 2020 and demand serious human rights reform. Even though the US is by far the largest humanitarian aid donor to Africa, It'll be difficult for Washington to build global momentum for holding Beijing accountable, given how unlikely many African leaders will risk ang angering China. The large, dependable block of African support that China enjoys will remain a competitive advantage for the Chinese Communist Party. African governments are helping downplay Beijing's large-scale human rights abuses in the Uyghur region and have helped Chinese nationals win leadership of influential international organizations. Can you please share any thoughts or potential solutions on this very important issue? That's an excellent question. Um, the ongoing um, uh, the crisis has uh, is a, a international um, uh, uh, aspect to it, uh, particularly on China's ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. In late 2018, uh, a state-run media uh, mocked the United States by stating something along the lines of, while the United States destroy your cities, uh, kill your people, we help you to rebuild your schools, roads, your infrastructure. The way that we're dealing with the uh, world's so-called Muslim problem, uh, you should follow our model. So that, that is one of the, uh, the official uh, uh, campaigns, uh, in addition to the economic, uh, uh, uh, economic activities taking place all around the world. This is the same thing as in Central Asia, similar uh, uh, situation in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, I, I don't particularly follow in Africa, but um, I wouldn't be surprised that uh, the Africans also feeling uh, uh, stuck in this uh, ongoing uh, geostrategic uh, uh, activities engaged by CCP in Africa. 
I introduced a bill that would keep Huawei Technologies or its subsidiaries and affiliates on the entity list. What other measures do you recommend Congress take up to prevent Chinese companies gaining wealth in the United States and to ensure U.S. companies do not have ties to Uyghur forced labor? Secretary Blinken told Congress in his uh, confirmation hearing that he will focus on two things. One, stop forced labor coming to the United States and our technology going to China to facilitate the ongoing genocide. I don't think that the Silicon Valley have, uh, vacant, has waken up to this brutality, uh, even in the face of the ongoing genocide. Uh, based on uh, the various reports, uh, the Silicon Valley companies are still providing uh, technology, transparent technology. Uh, they haven't come out uh, publicly condemn anything or cut ties with anything except for Apple uh, recently uh, told media that they are uh, cutting loose a, a questionable supplier that makes a film, all film for the iPhones. Uh, but Silicon Valley needs to step up to the plate. Uh, they haven't really um, publicly at least recognized the serious different issues. Previously, when they, when they come to testify in Congress, most of the CEOs from the Silicon Valley companies, high-tech companies, dodged the question about at least forced labor aspect of their business practices in China. Thank you for your time today. Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit for the record a report from RWR Advisory Group regarding companies' complicit complicity to the Uyghurs' atrocities. Uh, without objection. And the gentleman's time has expired. Um, we will now go to Representative Wild for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my first question is to Dr. Millward. Um, the European Parliament has spoken out and has imposed sanctions on China based on this issue. In response, China has leveled its own retaliatory sanctions and a planned China-EU trade agreement has been put on hold. Um, can, how, can you describe what the impact has been um, for, of the EU moves on, on this issue? and whether the pressure is affecting Beijing at this stage? I think the excessive PRC response to the EU and UK and Canadian sanctions uh, is a good sign that, uh, that the measures that, that uh, democracies are beginning to take are, are beginning to work. Um, I believe that we're um, four individuals and in one entity, if I remember correctly, that the uh, EU had in its own sanctions. And in response, uh, there were uh, many more, I think uh, 10 or 12, I'm forgetting the exact numbers, but um, including many parliamentarians um, of all of multiple parties in Europe, including a think tank, including an academic. Uh, and it really redounded against the interests of the PRC because it, it ground that investment deal to a halt. And it's now, we just saw yesterday, they're no longer uh, seeking ratification in the in the European Parliament for that. So I think this shows actually a kind of desperation on the part of the, of the PRC um, in how to deal with these uh, measures. And, and, and it, it simply shows how important multilateral responses are. And what do you think the U.S. administration's best steps are to coordinate with the EU and other international actors on this issue? I would say more of the same, and as, as has come up earlier on, I'm, yes, um, uh, a bigger boat, as Mr. Turkel said, uh, expanding to other countries um, through various means that he mentioned before, uh, just to show how seriously we take this. And it's not simply a U.S.-China issue, it's a, that it's the people of the world who are responding against these atrocities. And, and you're absolutely right about that. Um, I have, I, very, very early on in my time in Congress, I was visited by a Uyghur constituent in my district whose family has been persecuted because of their ethnicity and faith. I ran into uh, the husband of that family just the other night, and they, it's been now more than two years um, since I met with them, and they haven't heard a word and have no idea um, what has become of, of, his, of her, his wife's parents. Um, I'd like to direct my next question to Mr. Turkle. Mr. Turkle, um, I'll start with the question, which is, um, if passed by the Senate and signed into law, what impact do you believe that the legislation that was passed 
by this Congress uh, or by Congress last uh, term, um, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, if we were able to get that passed by the Senate and signed into law, what impact do you believe it would have in terms of putting significant economic pressure on the Chinese government? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for mentioning your constituents. Uh, we, we all, just quickly, there, there are hundreds of American citizens who are not even comfortable to come out and testify on behalf of their missing family members. We've been dealing with individually, privately with the, uh, with the victims, but more should come out. Uh, I think this should be prioritized. Saving American families should be prioritized in anything that we do with the Chinese. I'm and just... before, you, before you answer my question, let me just add to what you just yeah. said. I mentioned that it's been more than two years since I met with this family. I saw the husband the other night. I learned that his wife, whose parents are the ones who are affected, um, is in a severe depression. Um, she was not when I met with her. She was worried, but not in a severe depression, doesn't leave the, her home and is barely able to take care of her children, three of whom were born in the United States. So the problem is really significant. Yeah. But now I've not left you very much time. But what do you think the economic impact would be if we were able to get this legislation signed? It will be tremendous. But uh, the, the, the, the action, the, the legislative mandate should expand entire China, not only specifically the Uyghur region. Even if we stop the forced labor practices in the Uyghur region, the Chinese could easily relocate. Actually, it's already happening. They're removing the Uyghurs uh, to coastal uh, area assembly lines. This has been gone ongoing practice at least you know in the last 20 years. We just came to late end of the game to find out about these uh, practices. The good news about this, I think, is that we do have bipartisan support. And with that, I'll yield back. I know my time is up. Thank you very much, Mr. Turkle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now go to Representative Fluger, please. Go ahead, sir. You have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk about this issue. Um, and, and first off, I'd, I'd like to thank all of the panelists. Um, Ms. Ziwei uh, Wadun, thank you for your courage. Thank you for standing up for for uh, so many others around the world, and I know that this is, uh, um, you know, limited in scope to to this discussion. And uh, you know, we're, we appreciate your your courage to stand up, to tell the truth, um, and uh, to do the right thing. I uh, hear it's. Uh, I, I read your uh, your written testimony, um, you know, and it's uh, not without a lot of emotion. Uh, and so, um, I'd, I'd like to start my questions by uh, just asking you personally. Um, you know what, what your what your thoughts are on how the U.S. Congress can help um, to to make sure that we we get the facts out uh, and we hold those accountable for these atrocities. Tursunai Khan was so well. Men guvakhonsne ochdem night tasselandem. Sis shaksan. Siz uh, Amerika Avan Paltisi Amerikanın Kongresi Hükümeti Kanda Kılıp uh, Şu Uygurlarını Kolap Şu Hıhtay Hükümetini Cevap Kaylıqı Tatıdığanlıqını Dab bir adam siz Kanda ki adam kılalaymız Rahmet Mən Yıllar kırp çıxan Dim üzerine o psikoloji Tarafın turspolmaykan bazı sorular maştak belki değilse bir cevap vermeyi tekrar üzerindik kokmuş. O aşka aştak kitme, nurgun neslen day dayma şurukum da turdu diyemey. Aştak hinl kitme. Hazır. Evet biz ne biz ne hazır uyardık ki ahvanı bek iğer. Ya azır Xitay hükümetinin qolda mətnimiz Şərq Türkistanda turub atqan uyğurlarının şunun üçün Amerika hükümetinin mən bir lağır şahidi bütün axvanı gözümdə görən sübdə mən olmuş kimin ağlağan deyim mən bütün dəgən şahidlərin ağlağan deyim bizim avazımızı bütün dünyaya yetkizib bütün dünya birlikdə Amerika hükümeti olup 
hamse çoğum kıtayın bu birkaç kargancılığım tuhutuşka aşağı zulümden halkımız kutkuşka aşağı ki insan insan turda özne vicdanında uyla fakat uygur değil misin bir insan turda yardım bir işini hakik bir şıkkıl işini ümit kılma vay bir hanımdan gibi bugün o hemen toluk cevap veremedim ben ben açta hazır açta kop kaldım keçir onunla yanı bir kıtım sorayım o tehdit hazır rast bizim muşturkum yok her hıl süreçlerimizi kötürüp kutlayıp yani oktu oktumayı tehdit kılıp sözüm işaretim açta yaram kılıbadı da şu an aşkım ben de gelip korkunca tek yok bu mu aşkım o ben Çık nesle uçtak toluk cevap vereme kalma keçir onunla. Her vaxt Xtay'nın taşkışla ministeri aşırı kızma suratlarımızı kötürüp Kuvacıla ayallarının hatta şu Kulcahri hanım namı Nemes gümüş batırmış yakında aşırı tehdit sağlayıp bütün lagir şahitlerinin suratlarını kötürüp her kıl geplerle akaratla bizni Olmağır ağızlık yayın geple öyle müştah tehdit hem seyvat tutu, aşına hem bizim. Lekin Mən her vaxt İslam'ın ötünü soraydığındım. Bizden aşağıdık. Bu vatkan zulümle çok düşsün. İnsani turuldu. Yardım bir sonlarını, hakikaten bir iş kılışanlarını ümit kılma. Um, thank you. So ever since I got out of the camp, I've just been so nervous and so scared. Um, I find it difficult to speak sometimes. There are so many things that I want to say in my heart, but I can't always say them because it's very tough for me. Right now, the situation back there is very grave and Uyghurs in East Turkestan are in the hands of the Chinese government. As a camp survivor who saw everything that's happening, um, what I hope is that you can make our voices heard to the entire world, that the US government can stop the genocide, that it can stop the violence against Uyghurs, um, and you know, help us as humans. I hope that's what you can do is uh, help us as human beings. Um, another thing, just earlier, I didn't give a complete answer to the Congresswoman who asked a question of me. Um, as for threats against Uyghur women abroad, um, they have been showing our photos and threatening us. So for example, in the foreign ministry, they've been showing our photos. They did this to Ms. Gulchehra recently. They're doing it to all of the survivors. They're slandering us, saying absolutely horrible things, threatening us with unimaginable words. And so what I always ask of you is to help us as human beings help us end this violence. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I can, I hear the the pain and I, while I have no idea how the, you know, what the experiences actually are, I appreciate your, your bravery, your courage to tell the truth here. And, and I hope that this committee uh, will take that human side of it into account. Um, and I, I truly appreciate your story as a father of three daughters I want you to know that I hear you loud and clear, um, and I think everyone on this committee does. Uh, Dr. Uh, Millward, uh, as I listen to that um, and I read and hear your statement uh, about the gratuitous provocations, what I'd like to ask you is where do we draw the line? Because accountability does need to happen, um, and, and we need to make sure uh, that we do hear um, the, the concerns, that we stand up for the human side of this, and that we also hold those accountable. And I'd like to, where do we draw that line, you know, uh, on on our ability to hold them accountable? If you can explain on that, we only have 30 seconds left, please. Well, that's, of course, the, the question. I think um, Mr. Turkel has listed uh, ways to expand the kinds of sanctions that we can, can put. I've suggested that we need to look at the partnership pairing program 
which brings it beyond Xinjiang to include the involvement of other corporations and other administrations throughout China. And I strongly favor those kinds of uh, targeted sanctions, but targeting more places that are involved in what's going on. Uh, and I think that's the only thing that we really can do to maintain our own and values and try to help Tris and I and her relatives and many, many others. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this hearing. I yield back. Thank you uh, very much. We will now go to Representative Cicilline for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to begin by thanking uh, Chairman Meeks and, and Ranking Member McCall for calling this hearing. And, you know, I think as we've listened to this testimony, we recognize that we're confronted with this incredible responsibility of shedding light on the gravest of all crimes. Uh, and as members of the Foreign Affairs Committee, as members of Congress, and and frankly, as citizens of the world, we uh, will never have a greater responsibility than to do all that we can uh, to expose crimes against humanity and genocide and do everything we can to stop them. So this is a sober um, and serious responsibility. And I really thank the witnesses for their testimony. Um, I want to start with you, Professor uh, Millward. The Chinese government uh, and the authorities in Xinjiang are, have targeted the Uyghur population using really cutting edge technologies. Uh, obviously to censor speech with the intent of suppressing free thought and political dissent. You likened this to locking up Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other non-Han people in an extra legal network of what, what you describe as concentrated educational transformation centers. What can the United States and our partners and the technology firms in, in the United States and around the world do to hinder the use of the technologies in China? And how can we better ensure that China will not or that will at least make it difficult for China to export these technologies abroad to other authoritarian or hybrid regimes to do the same kind of harm. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I'm actually going to, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to toss that to, to Nuri because he's gone through the specifics and, and, and knows, for example, pending and possible legislation about that. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, a couple of things we could do um, in the short term and the long term. One, we should uh, start documenting uh, the ongoing state violence against the Uyghurs uh, with the ultimate goal to hold those to account through domestic courts or international uh, court of justice somewhere, somehow. Uh, that process needs to be uh, started. In fact, the UHRP Act uh, that uh, Congress passed and enacted last June directs our law enforcement to specifically work on these issues. Uh, in bare minimum, protect the well-being of Uyghur American citizens here in the homeland. And also the other thing that I think uh, will also, uh, uh, sh uh, the DOJ particularly could consider doing it is to open an investigation against technology firms uh, that has business presence in the United States that have been responsible for facilitating the ongoing uh, high-tech genocide against the Uyghurs. That is doable. Uh, the companies that, uh, uh, that, that have a, a business presence, active business activities, falls under the jurisdiction of our courts. That should be looked at. Um, and then also, um, as, a, as a capitalist economy, we cannot dictate the companies to uh, engage in business a certain way. But what we can do is to advise them to put in place good compliance program, good uh, corporate governance. The previous administration issued business advisory. I in encourage and urge the, uh, the current administration, the Obama, uh, Biden administration to renew, update that business advisory so that American businesses will at least stop being complicit on ongoing crime. We've been told as consumers that the American businesses figure out to do business in China, but they're caught in crossfire. They, they need to be told uh, that there's some of this behaviors need to stop. Thank you. Um, Ms. Tristan A, thank you for your incredibly powerful testimony. You are a woman of extraordinary courage. And I first want to say I'm very sorry that you experienced the experiences you did in listening to your story. We could can't even imagine um, how you have suffered. But your testimony is perhaps the most powerful testimony I've ever heard, and I think that the committee and the, and the country can hear. And so my question is, 
where have you found that courage to share the story and how can we encourage other survivors to share their stories because i do think it is the most powerful way to activate the world against the chinese government for engaging this behavior and so what can we do to encourage others to um, do what you have done and share their experience as other survivors in Tayan, Jasurber Ayal, men Ikangs ne Anlap, Shunda Kunglum Bierum Bolde, his Dash Lakulamensiske, Sisnong Bishungasden Utkusgen, Isarangasden, Sis Bergen Guvachluk, men Angloran Guvachluk Lanung, and Kuchliki. Sisden Suraidran Soalum, Sis. Bundach ber jasarat lik ber karakter ni sis nadin tapasis nadin tapdangas bu ish berinci sualam andan ishkinci sualam biz kanda kalib başkalarını sis ke oxşas sözletişke ilham bir alemiz bunu ber depesangas. Nam bun bun jasarat kilish mam asam bun madi. Belki zaman dalsla men at Amerika ki mugiçi bu da karar kilish ki mu pek kasboldi mam. Lakin mina aş xtayım kumeti na jasarla girdi ki belli yat kaninim de kızlarına ahvaldır ne öz gözümle körü çıkan şeyler dedi. Her vakit mana o aram demdi. Jürükümle tatlı. Kan ikhtiratı jürgümden her vakit olan oylağa baktığımda olanın benim köz aldığımda aşın başın mağın uçuşan aşın da ahvalı uçturganlarım ve öz ağız közü bilen saran olup kağan hatta ilişip kağan eşitim bilme ölüp getkilen közüm bile kögeşke men boş kararı kedişke ahire eşinimi karmasın üzemden öz abroyumum oylmasın hatta üzemin kurmuşunum oylmasın boş kararı kedişke çünkü şunun kutluluk bu dünyada hakikat babosa aşlanın aş aşlakta kıymetken kıtay hükümetinin kulu tekmece şu cezalar girdi cigirmece hatta müdahsız kişi vetken bir gün kızlanın tek aş depsencilik yaşadıktan ne ben bu durumda ben kıtay hükümeti yalan yapmadı da her vakit yetiş kanda toptap kargını yok emniyetle. Ne tür kesin ki ben terminalın içi de kabul edemedim. O yüzden herkes bu iş bulardı. Baş buluş için işte mi karmasın bu cesaret ki geldim. Herkes zorluk et insan işte gerçekten insan tuğba adam bunda cesaret ki de oylayın. Çünkü mine o zorluk mu diye o det. Aslında kandılam. Küçük ana bosun mana ya etrafımda yardım birdan var insanla cekaysa. Şu çağda bir gengleyme de oldum. Mağmı o pek eğer geldi. Şu an hazır zemmeli pek. Meyli bunda kıyın alsam mı çok. Aşlanı kutkuzmuş için yerden bir sonan ümit kılma. Thank you. Um, it's not that I'm courageous, really. It was, um, it was so difficult for me to get all the way here, but I think about the the situation um, that the women I saw and know are in. Um, and ever since then, I I've just I have no rest. I cannot rest. My heart is constantly bleeding, and I can see them in front of my eyes. Uh, these are people who experienced you know the same things as I did, and I saw people who went crazy. I saw people who even died and so i made this decision to do what i'm doing thinking of really very little else not even my own life but if there is such a thing as truth you know, in this world there are innocent people who are being sentenced in these camps to 20 years or to life and and china all along is lying telling lies i will not stop I have found some courage from this. Um, I, I think that this kind of courage perhaps comes from the, you know, a, a feeling 
of humanity. And I, you know, I hope that through doing this, I will be become lighter one day because this has been so very heavy for me. And so I ask um, for your help in this work. Man, Қытай жазар лагердің мен шықпаған уақытымда менің ол үшін Қазақстан Қазақ райдың бұғашқы мені шық кетелді, мен шық кеткен уақытымда аш қызларына жағылған ебі аш яны бір қатым есіма келді қаттық шығылап кеткен бір қыз бойным ғайсып ал ер деген сән ол үшін Қазақ бұғашқы шық кетелді ол біз бүшін ғашады өліп кеттіміз ғой тұрсын айғасы өліп кеттіміз ғой Aslan ahvalını bana hazırlıkçı bilmeyim mi? Ula emez kalırım bilmeyim mi? Ula kılışamayım mı? So when I got out of the camp, it's because my husband is a Kazakhstan citizen. And so I was able to get out. But now thinking of all of this, I'm remembering the sound of their crying voices. Um, they said, you know, you're getting out of here because your husband is Kazakh, but we are going to die here. Tursunai, we will die here. And I, I just I think of those girls. I, I don't, I'm not in touch with them. I don't know what's happened to them. Tell her she's helping them by her voice. And I know my time is inspired. Siz avazınızını anlatıp Allah'a yadam kılavat siz. Thank you. I would just add that and I know this is very, very difficult, but the, the Chinese government is very powerful. But the truth that you are speaking is much more powerful, even though you are just one person. And, and I hope that is some comfort. Bundak is non sizgen haydi tas kildan rangs ne bilaman. Hta yukmeti uzi be kuchli lekin siz torsen ahanam siz davatan gatla tehmo kuchli. Um, I will now uh, yield uh, five minutes to Representative Young Kim. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and I, I want to offer my special thanks to our witnesses joining us today. And a special thanks to Ms. Uh, Ziwa Wudin for your bravery and sharing your story. It's heartbreaking to hear what you had to experience. And yes, you asked us to hear your testimony. We have heard your testimony and we will take action and we'll do more to provide voice to voiceless. And this hearing is just the start of that process to amplify stories like yours. The ongoing genocide occurring in Xinjiang is as shocking as it is deplorable and it's wrong. And I'm glad that the Biden administration has also recognized it as a genocide too. The situation in Xinjiang is unacceptable. And I call upon the Biden administration to work more closely with our allies and partners to hold the Chinese Communist Party accountable for its abuses and stop the wiping out of the Uyghur and uh, Kazakh people. So let me ask uh, Dr. Will uh, Millward, uh, I'm going to direct my first question to you regarding the United States support for Uyghur population in China. Can you describe some of the difficulties our mission China personnel have faced in tackling the challenges relating to the Uyghur population in China? For example, what is the Uyghur language capability among our foreign service officers to impact our ability to operate effectively in country? I don't know if any of our foreign service officers, I suspect a few do. I've actually known some who've asked me about how to study and so on. And, and, and so I don't want to, uh, I don't want to speak without really knowing. Uh, clearly, we don't have a lot of that kind of, uh, that kind of knowledge. Um, the, the, our, our translator today, um, uh, Dr. Anderson, is probably among the best speakers of Uyghur among uh, non-Uyghurs in the United States, but there aren't very many such such people. Um, and, and I think this speaks to a slightly broader issue of Uyghur, Tibetan, um, perhaps even Mongolian. And, and you know, China is a very diverse place. And so our, our training about that and our foreign uh, missions um, need to recognize that. I'm not saying they don't recognize that, but, but greater recognition of that uh, is very, is very important. Um, 
the, the closure of the consulate in Chengdu, um, which the PRC enforced in retaliation for our closure of the Texas consulate, their Texas consulate, uh, I think that has been unfortunate, uh, an unfortunate side effect of, of that has been that the entire inland uh, and much of the non-Han parts of the People's Republic of China are now thousands of miles further away from a U.S. consulate, which is, of course, necessary if you wish to seek visas and other sorts of things. So, oh, Thank um, you, Mr. Roller. I, yes. I do recognize there is that difficulty there. But, uh, you know, I, I, let me continue on with my questions to uh, Mr. Torkel. Now that uh, more countries outside of the United States and UK, including much of Europe and Australia, are finally recognizing the ongoing atrocities occurring in Xinjiang, do you view Islamic majority nations in the Middle East and South Asia as being more willing to speak out on abuses directed towards Muslim minorities living in China? What can the United States do to elevate Muslim voices around the world on this issue? Um, as I pointed out earlier, um, um, we need to engage, uh, we need to uh, step up uh, public diplomacy, uh, counter Chinese uh, uh, disinformation campaign. They have been very uh, effective, uh, sadly, uh, misinforming the public and the Muslim streets. And also they've been using the economic uh, uh, uh, power to buy out silence. So we need to counter these two, uh, two aspects of the Chinese engagement. And also, um, I think this is also applies to everyone, including uh, policymakers in the United States. No country will have an effective foreign policy engagement or policies with respect to China unless they recognize the danger that CCP is posing. So the sometimes recognizing the issue, uh, mm -hmm. calling it what it is, is as important as a substantive policy response. So I urge everyone uh, who are in the policy position to recognize the danger that CCP is posing uh, in international uh, uh, forum, domestically, diplomatically, economically. Right. I don't think we dispute that part there. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Wooler, let me get back to you. Um, as you Time's expired, as Representative Kim, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, OK, thank you. I yield back. Thank you so, thank you so much. Um, we will now go to Representative uh, Phillips for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to all of our witnesses, uh, particularly to you, Ms. Tursenay. Uh, your courage uh, is not just an inspiration to those of us in the United States Congress, Democrats and Republicans, uh, but all Americans uh, and all of humanity. Uh, and we wish to thank you. Uh, I'd like to discuss uh, and uh, learn more about the surveillance uh, that has been detailed uh, to some degree. Uh, but if perhaps you could describe what you were subjected to, uh, both uh, when you were in detention uh, and also when you were not. Uh, we would like to hear more. Thank you. Lager nung ichida ve lager nung sirtida uzungiz meselen kanda kütüş ve kontrol kılınış ahvallarga yoluktunuz. Bunu bir çendirup bergen bolsunuz. Bu Behle kontrollukta onun içinde fakat birbirimizi karab yap kalışına özümü pek iğir derecede onun içinde cinayet hesap bulundu. Yap kalmayızla uçak cazalımız. Şuncilik derecede başkalarını hesap kalmağında. Fakat o bunu yapmış turuş, yetiş, uxlaş, hatta kayak karab uxlaş bizden kolların bir şey olmalı. Mayak karab uxlaş, mayakka öğrülmeyemiz, madırmay uxlaysız. Vakt tur diyen vaxta da turp olsuz, tamak ye diyen vaxta değilsiz. Her vakit aslında o kontrolü kamera buldu. Bir öğün açıda işki üç yerde. E, Lagerin tijiği çıkan bir gün mu? Oğuşaşla. Şu çıkan günün başlıkla, ben lagerin çıkan günümle aşı. E, şu günle gelip e, işki adamı konuştu, olmaştırı bir durdu. Her vakit ben yangıl uçağıda yol düşünüyorum. Yangıl tuğan bulsam mı? Yenim de bir ayağı gelip konattı. Her vakit ben kontrol oturattım. Mesela bir yer bir iş üçüm mu? Kilip aç sakçadan. Güvenli. Üzerinden mesela sakçı. 
Hatta şu üç üç yerden tam kabastırıp kağız edip, ben satık çıkalaydım, bu mısır fakat o hatta şu üç yerden teşhik çıkamaydım. Her gün bir başı konuşanlar usul oynaştı diyende, aslında hareketler bile aslında nimsi bula kontrol oldu bulattı. Mesela ben çıkıp yattınca, o zaman işte on dokuz yattınca mezgulda visa açtırıyor, ürümcü gibi bağı vakitinde aslında fakat başka sırk çıkmadım şundan dahmini. Aşta üç parç kağıt verdi, aşı tam o basan aşınam bulan badım. Bağa yirmide yana, bana bir yer geldim de video klip hemen etrafında aşta evet mi yani sahtara, aşta kontrol oldu buldum ben. Bugün kege yanda yana sahtala mine aş kurtudula mine gözüm kameradan çıkıp durdu ki gözümden aş şükrep kilit min tutup aşta kitaptı nim buldu da meherem kırp. Sen sen nim kan ürünüş kırk en kense her mandakta mümkün şampanya dramı koyu körüp öyle teşhir koyu tetti. Fakat sarık çıkış mümkün değil her vakit sarık memle bile cüretti. So in the camps everything was controlled um, it, to a degree such that it was difficult for us to even talk to one another. There was the threat of punishment if we did. We had to move certain ways, put our heads this way or that way. Uh, we were not allowed to move when we slept. We had to get up when they said, we had to eat when they said, and they could see everything from cameras. There were two or three of them in each cell. Outside the camps, it was very similar. Uh, for example, the very day I got out, I was assigned a, a man and woman to come sleep at my home at all times with me and be at home with me. So I was always under control. Just to go somewhere, I had to go to three different places, the Public Security Bureau, the Neighborhood Committee, and also to a special police officer assigned just to me in order to get permission to move from one place to another. Um, in addition, every day I had to go out into the square and dance. Um, so they even had control over what sorts of activities we did. Um, and so after I was out in July of 2019, I went to Urunchi to get a visa. Um, and after I was there, I didn't really even go anywhere in the city, but I had these three different documents that I had gotten stamped to allow me to go there. And then once I was actually there, I had to send videos back to my police officer showing where I was. Uh, when I walked out on the streets, um, there were cameras that you know would recognize me just by my eyes. And so the cameras would recognize me and then police officers would come out you know, running up to me and, and saying, oh, you're somebody who's been in a camp before um, and, you know, would ask to see my ID card and so forth. Uh, thank you for, for sharing some more detail. Uh, Mr. Turkel, um, you, you mentioned in your testimony uh, some of the digital surveillance uh, uh, that is happening. Could you, could you elaborate a bit on that practice and, and most importantly, how the U.S. government and international community uh, should be working to counter it. Um, in a uh, New York Times piece in summer 2019, a reporter uh, mentioned something quite chilling. He was standing uh, in an intersection. He counted 20 surveillance camera over his head. Uh, that is just one street corner. So what the Chinese have done is to uh, test uh, and use these technology uh, and expanding it. So the Chinese surveillance technology is metastasizing. Reportedly, uh, over 80 countries have either adopted or in the process of adopting Chinese surveillance. What does that mean? That is a threat against civil liberty, threat against democracy, threat against international rules-based uh, uh, system. So this is, this is significantly uh, a, a dangerous pro uh, a trend that everyone should be uh, literally screaming from the rooftop. The Chinese uh, use the Uyghur body, soul, their cities, homes, uh, for testing this technology now that it's, it's metastasizing. Thank you, sir. And Dr. Millward, I, I just have about 30 seconds left. Anything that you might want to add relative to the uh, use of surveillance and tactics uh, that we should be employing to counter it? There's more and more evidence that 
these systems were developed in Xinjiang and aimed at uh, non-Han peoples in Xinjiang. But they're not limited to that, as, as Mr. Turkel was just saying. Um, in many ways, they're expanding to other parts of China as, as well, and, uh, and obviously uh, you know, around, around the world. But um, it's not simply a security measure in Xinjiang. It's much broader than that and therefore much more worrisome. I see my time has expired. Thank you all again to our witnesses. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Congressman Phillips. We'll, we'll now go to Congressman Levin in his car. Go ahead, <laughs> Andy, five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me pick up where Representative Phillips just left off. Um, you know, Dr. Miller, I point out is I'm sure you, you'd agree that a lot of these surveillance uh, technologies and tactics, um, the, the Chinese started, the, the government started using them in Tibet, and they've greatly expanded them, and they're really using them not only in Xinjiang, but all around the country. But let me just ask you about access to information. The government, the, the Chinese government is deliberately preventing journalists, diplomats, and human rights monitors from accessing uh, the region. And then they're pushing propaganda and we can't verify numbers or anything else independently. So can you speak to that challenge and how should the U.S. government and the international, international community best counter this difficult situation? Well, obviously, we have, Dr. Milford, right? we have big problems, big problems of information. Um, that said, our evidence about what's going on is voluminous, right? And so, we, in many, many ways in which even through open source materials, uh, research open lists can, can know generally what's going on. I would just say that it doesn't really serve the People's Republic of China's own purposes to keep journalists out. Right, they're they're very very worried about reporting on what they see as the bad stories, uh, but there's no reporting on the good stories either. That's possible, uh, and so this leads to more distance between our peoples. It's hard to know what you know average people's lives are like, um, and so I guess you know we, we need to try to back off and restore those kinds of contacts and get journalists back in. I think I think access to the press should be a priority that we're pushing for in our conversations with with china and the olympics might be one uh lever for that probably um the you know there's been reporting that uh the biden administration is kind of leading the g7 from a group of just industrial powers to a group of democracies, a group of countries interested in human rights. Don't you think that any solution here has to be deeply multilateral? And how, what, do you, what is your suggestion to us thinking broadly about really, this gets to the whole U.S. approach to foreign policy to tackle a problem like this, to take it on in a fully multilateral way? What would that, what does that even meet you know what should we be looking for the olympics obviously be an example of you know a whole global event but what are your thoughts i'm sorry representative uh, representative 11 was that addressed at me or uh, yes you? yes sorry yeah. Yeah, sorry uh, well i think it uh i i mean i referenced in my written remarks uh, trying to use terms such as you know, human values and, ref and you know, the broader world community looking at this, um, trying to kind of raise our concerns to a higher, a higher supranational level, I think is very important and address these. Um, you know, there's a reason why they're called human rights, right? So I think that kind of messaging would be you know, very, very important, as well as the sorts of diplomatic work that I mentioned earlier uh, with other nations as well, not simply Western democracies. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me close with some words 
to Ms. Uh, Ms. Torse and I. Ms. Torse and I, I want you to know that I see you, I hear you, your voice is incredibly powerful, your story is so compelling, I believe you. And we, as Democrats and Republicans, as members of the House, as Americans, will share your story with all of our constituents and we will fight for you and your people. We are your partners, and your courage is an inspiration to us. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Levin. And why don't we uh, translate your words? Let's yes, yes. Thank you. Torsunai Hanum, ha, Dedran Bergipin, Mensis Nikurman, Ma Avazans Angladim, Bona Bilip Toyang. Sizdan hikayingiz in tayin küçlük ve in tayin adamın tesirlen durduğun bir hikaye. Men sizge işini men. Biz hemimiz meyli oncula bulaylı, meyli solcula bulaylı, meyli kongresinin adamları bulaylı. Biz hemimiz amrıklık buluş, süpte biz bilen sizni kollaymız. Pek çok rahmet. Hem olanın başında bu konu bölüp, bizden başı bulutkan, ırkı kırgınçılık hazır. Kıtay hükümetin oman kızı batkan uyğurlarla başı ırkı kırgınçılık mı toktu düştüm. Başta konu bölüp atkan her kanda hükümet ürün bozun. İnsanlı turgada yardım veriyorum her kanda insanlığa. Hem size rahmet ettim ben. Çin kalbimden peşin iyi bir rahmet ettim ben. Elim hemen yana bütün dünyaya Maymuş avazımızı yetkizip, yana kızılmış avazımız bulup, bütün dünyanı başlatmış Amerika hükümetinden. Benim kalbimden, şunda birinci uğrunda da öyleyim, bunun ağlığında mı? Bütün halep başlattık, insanlar açtık. Bu taraf mı ağlayıp, biz vatanımızda toplandı mı? Amerika ise bir devlet, en bir, üçüncülük bir, küşlük bir devlet de. Hatta, Kıtay'ımı Amerika'dan hep tadı da, her vakit dağıdığın Amerika'dan. Amerika'dan korkumuz bu meydan bu sa bütün dünyanın yap koyulmuz bade insan olarak nasıl bizim gibi dayıdan şu aşkım ben bütün dünya başlamış bulup bütün ben devletle başlam bulup birlik kilip dayıdan bu kara ikka kırıncı on çok top çok um insanı turgada ular bir yerden bir şey mi kalma ben çok kalın dünyanı bir kırışlar açık insanlar şu ben sen yanlış mı sorayım? Rahmet. I want to say a big thank you to you for these words. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I'm thankful to all of you for all that you are doing um, to work on this issue. I hope that you would please make our voices heard to the entire world and that you will lead the world in this. The US government has um, a special place in my heart and I hope that you will continue to help us. We see the U.S. government, we see the United States as very powerful in the world. And in fact, China is always saying that it is afraid of the U.S., that if it weren't for the U.S., otherwise it would be able to eat up the entire world. And I so hope that you will continue um, in this you know, humanitarian way to help us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I will recognize myself uh, now for a few questions, and I, and I want to come back to the, the this theme of the surveillance state that a number of uh, other members uh, and of course the witnesses have, have touched on uh, and you know we've heard some stories ab about relatively old-fashioned uh, surveillance uh, people you know, being forced to uh, take in informants in their homes for example based on just you know large numbers of of, of people working for the Chinese security police but a lot of it is, uh, is quite sophisticated technologically, and I and I just want to um, maybe ask you, uh, Mr. Turkel, to to talk about the role that facial recognition technology plays in all of this. It's not just cameras; it's what it's the software behind the cameras. Is that not right? Yes, yes. Yeah. This surveillance is happening both in China and here to our fellow Americans. 
Uh, on, in China, uh, initially they started with uh, collecting voice samples, uh, iris scans, uh, DNA samples to build this giant uh, biometric data for the Uyghurs. And that, that paved the way for using inter integrated joint operating platform that Human Rights Watch documented, reverse right. engineered to collectively rounding up people. So now if you go to any Uyghur homes, uh, they have a QR code on the door. So the, the, the officials can scan and find out who lives there, what kind of relatives at home uh, in China and abroad, what kind of profession that they have, uh, the, the past writings, the job, this job history, everything, even the way that they engage in, in, in the pract uh, religious practice. And here at home, uh, based on the report that UHRP published in 2019, they're using uh, telephone messages, video chat to uh, threaten the Uyghur Americans uh, in homeland here. And also yep. um, uh, Darren Byler, an American scholar, uh, went to China in 2019, came back with a, a bone chilling report, uh, reported that uh, close to 1 million Chinese cadres have been implanted in the Uyghur homes, uh, eating with them, sleeping with them, uninvited. And, and there have been also reported sexual violence against the Uyghur woman whose husband had been taken to the camps. So this has been let, happening. Let me, in let me stop aspect. you there, because I want to I, I want to move this along just a bit. Um, the, the technology, the, the system, as you mentioned, is exported. And this is something that concerns all of us. It's one reason why this is a threat to the world. But the technology is imported in, in many cases. Um, you know, we know that, for example, Intel and NVIDIA uh, chips uh, are uh, helping help to power the supercomputers that China uses to manage all this data. Oracle has uh, provided technology to, to Chinese police. Hewlett Packard owns 49% of H3C, a company, a Chinese company that provides the switches, surveillance network control systems uh, to law enforcement in Xinjiang and, and around, uh, around China. Um, I, I, I assume you would think it would be helpful for Congress to go beyond just recommending voluntary due diligence on the part of US companies, but to actually prohibit the export of technology to China that could be used in commission of these human rights abuses? Certainly, uh, the existing laws, the existing resources are not enough sufficient right. to tackle these. And we did in fact pass such legislation in the House twice uh, last year, including as part of the, the national defense bill, uh, which was uh, strangely and mysteriously stripped uh, from the final bill by the Senate Banking Committee. We're going to try to do this again Absolutely. Uh, this year. Um, I'll just end on a, uh, uh, I want to shift and then make a point uh, about the, the, the diplomacy that's needed in the Muslim world. Um, and I want to ask uh, you quickly, have you seen any evidence of, for example, the Arab satellite networks running um, documentaries, shows, news about what's happening? happening to the Uyghurs just very quickly. They, I have not seen the satellite, but they have been uh, using the diplomatic uh, representatives in Beijing on CGTN to uh, dissipate uh, misinformation about. Right. Yeah. Yeah, until that starts happening. And, and, and you know, I, I give this administration credit for beginning to raise this issue globally in a way that we haven't before. But frankly, it, it, it, particularly in the Middle East, unless this becomes part of the priority conversation, which right now is dominated understandably by issues like Iran and uh, recognition of Israel and the situation in, in Yemen and many other issues we want them to be raising with these countries. Um, unless my friend Brett McGurk, the coordinator for the Middle East at the NSC, puts this on his agenda when he has breakfast with the Emirati ambassador, it's just not gonna change. And I think this is something that we need to be um, uh, pressing with the administration as we uh, as we take on this issue. Um, my, my time is uh, uh, my time is up. Um, I see uh, Representative Manning. Um, uh, uh, so we'll go to you and I see Representative Omar has joined us as well. So let's go to uh, Representative Manning first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There have been a lot of important discussions during this hearing about the ways we can put pressure on the Chinese 
in an effort to change their policy. And that certainly will take a lot of time. I think it's important that we move forward on those things. But in the meanwhile, people are suffering. So I'd like to focus on how we can help people uh, escape this desperate situation. Mr. Turkle, can you tell us, are there any countries beside the U.S. that are accepting Uyghur refugees? Yes, yeah. uh, Sw Sweden and Germany. Uh, Sweden uh, made a public statement that uh, it will accept uh, Uyghur refugees in the country. Germany, after making a fateful mistake, uh, issued a statement that no Uyghur seeking asylum will be uh, repatriated to China. But most of the Western democracies, uh, specifically Western European countries, Canada, uh, New Zealand, Australia, have been very welcoming to Uyghur refugees. And are there uh, any, th any things we can do to encourage more countries to accept uh, Uyghur refugees? Absolutely. Uh, the Uyghurs have not been benefited from uh, uh, the resettlement program that we historically been um, uh, engaged, uh, practiced. So, so if, if, if the Uyghurs are given a priority in the Biden administration's refugee resettlement program, uh, in, in, a, in a significant number. We're not talking about 10, 15,000, but at least 5,000 Uyghurs who have been hi in hiding in the Middle Eastern countries uh, or in the face, in the verge of being deported to China would be a good start. But uh, there's something else we can do. Let's uh, have an asylum interview arranged for asylum applicants like Tursun Aziyautun here. They have now, we have three, uh, four uh, uh, camp survivors who are waiting for asylum hearing, uh, asylum interviews. We're talking about uh, uh, asylum pending since 2018. So these kind of things can be done. So uh, DHS can at least schedule asylum interviews for the pending affirmative asylum applicants in the United States. Is there any way to know the number of refugees who would want to leave the country if there were places for them to go? Uh, you mean China or? For people who, Uyghurs who would like to leave China, any idea how many? Uh, Con Congresswoman, ironically, in a genocidal situation, the, the, the perpetrators usually kick out the population from, the, uh, from their ancestral homeland. Whereas in China, they're preventing the Uyghurs leaving. They're starting with uh, confiscating passports. I haven't seen my mother since my law school graduation in 2004, simply because the Chinese won't give her a passport to leave the country. So they cannot leave. But we can start with the ones who are already outside of China in Central Asia, Turkey, and the other Middle, East, uh, Middle Eastern countries. Thank you for that. And I'm sorry about your personal situation. Uh, Mr. Millward, uh, in your written testimony, you mentioned that the CCP is inflicting atrocities on a variety of non-Han peoples. Are there ethnic groups other than the Uyghurs who are experience, experiencing repression, torture, similar to the atrocities that we're hearing about today? Yes, I mean, we've see, heard examples of Kazakhs, um, who are of course another Central Asian uh, people, but uh, uh, I've heard of a small group known as Dongshang who are suffering from this. They are, you know, many Muslim groups. I don't want to, um, in my testimony, I don't want to say it is not targeting Muslim peoples. It certainly certainly is. But others have been pulled in as well. Um, the, the Hui group, who are Chinese-speaking Muslims in China, um, in Xinjiang, but also outside of Xinjiang, are increasingly coming under this kind of pressure with destruction of architecture, with arrest of religious personnel and and so on. So it is a it's a very broad a broad problem. Thank you. I'd like to use the rest of my time just to say to Ms. Tersene, I want to thank you for sharing your your horrifying story because you've brought to this terrible treatment of the Uyghurs, you you've brought it to life for us in a way that was so compelling that I don't think any of us who heard you today will ever be able to forget the plight of the Uyghurs and our moral obligation to work to end this genocide. So thank you very much for your courage today. Um, Change get equal to us, uh, begin get go back on us, but then, 
Ama hiç kaysımız şu bir ömür unutup kalmayımız. Hikayenizde unutup kalmayımız. Rahmet. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Manning. Um, and finally, we will uh, go to Representative Omar for five minutes. Thank you, and I just want to uh, thank all of our uh, panelists um, for for their bravery and for this great discussion. Um, Mr. Turkle, when we were holding 22 Uyghurs at Guantanamo, none of whom had any known anti-American sentiment, you were probably the most vocal advocate for their release. We also saw in the documents leak to the New York Times last year that one of the things President Xi said was that he wanted to emulate America's war on terror tactics. Can you tell us uh, your perspective on the relationship between how Xi justifies the atrocities against the Uyghurs and the global phenomenon of Islamophobia? No country treats the Muslims the way that the China treats uh, uh, the Uyghurs uh, around the world. I mean, arguably, there are other co Canada countries, but there's nothing even comparable. Uh, Islamophobia is, is a hallmark of their Chinese uh, policies. And also, um, I have to note this. Uh, this is not the first time that I'm testifying and making this comment. I think it was a mistake for the United States government uh, in 2002-2003 uh, uh, designating this obscure organization, East Turkestan Islamic Movement, as a terrorist organization. That, that paved the way for this comfortable labeling Uyghurs as a terrorist. The U.S. State Department last year revoked that decision, but the damage is already done. Even surprisingly in the Uyghur dictionary, the word terrorism or terrorist does not even exist. The Uyghurs probably did the most pacified Muslims that you can find on the face of the earth. And yet, because of the anti-Muslim sentiment around the world and the mistakes made by some Western governments in Europe and here at home, the Chinese opportunistically using it for advancing its uh, propaganda campaign. It's working, unfortunately. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I've, I've been raising uh, the, that, that concern, how war on terror has justified um, atrocities being committed against Muslims uh, throughout the world. I also wanted to ask you about something I think we both found, find uh, atrocious, which is the number of U.S. companies and individuals who are profiting off of atrocities against the Uyghurs. Can you tell us about uh, Eric Prince's contract um, in the uh, uh, Uyghur region? This question to me, uh, directed to me or uh, professional? Yes. Um, I, I, I, was, uh, I was somewhat dumbfounded that Eric Prince acknowledged uh, in his conversation with Mahdi Hassan on Al Jazeera that he, has, uh, he is training the police academy or the police force. And, and now it's, it's, it's becoming a, a criminal activity because we have, as a country, uh, uh, added 48, uh, the entire police department in the Uyghur region to the entity list, including this one uh, credited in the movie Mulan uh, for, for, for their assistance. So, so it's unconscionable, and this is uh, initially started in Hong Kong, and now uh, reportedly uh, expanded to a training police force in the Uyghur region. So um, uh, this is something that, that Congress and law enforcement need to look into. We really appreciate that. And I, I wanted to ask um, Ms. Sia Wudu, um how she would respond to people and i know i could ask all the panelists this question but to the people who say that um you know the atrocities that are being committed against the the uyghurs it's sort of a propaganda and it doesn't really exist it's not something that is happening i get called out often um every time i speak about the atrocities that are happening um to to the uyghurs can you respond to those people who uh, don't believe what happened to you is a real thing. Torsen Aykhanım Qasawal. Siz Uyghurlağa ilip birilip atkan işlani yalğan deydigan adamlarga qandaq dap javab berisiz? Nimi deysiz? Yalğan dap çıqsa.
İnek paketlerini hazır bilmeyi demeyim ama inek bildi. Biz de bütün dünyada hazır bilmeyi adam kalmadı desin buldu. Hakikaten bir Polat'ta paket mi var? Hazır körüp türüydü. Bunun közünü jumbağın adam çokum. O kutay bile ya ki soğudu münasibeti var. Ya ki o kutayağın münasibeti bir şıkkılık özünün başka terapilik bir baş tarafını oylanlı bir adam bulmasa onun da başkasına hemen onun köz jumbaydı. Hakikaten insan özünün vicdanı bilen bir bir insan bulsa Yürgün tutup durup olsa insanla yardım verdiğin adam da oylamaydı da oylam. Uyadı fakat Uyğurlu emez, Uyğurlu'la üşmanlık kıldağınlar dediyse. Nekin Uyadı Uyğur, Kazak her kandak milletle olup musulman dendi ki milletlerine hemiz Kazak bulsun, Kırgız bulsun, Özbek bulsun, Aştak milletler var. Hemiz var Aşlanın bir Kıtay milletinin başkası değil. Bunun için de bir Kıtay milleti yok. Şu anda bu Kıtay hükümetinin mahsus Aştak kartuğun bir şey Müslümanlar da böyle mi? Bunun közüm kan. Ne çokum aştak var. Bu mesela onun da başka ben onun da başka işim diyeyim ben. Şun dahilim bu mesela onun da başka ben közüm ama ya da kan derece o iyi. There are clear facts, and it's not just us who knows this. It's everyone in the world who knows what's going on. These facts are strong like steel and anyone who says otherwise is closing their eyes. Maybe they have some sort of relationship with China, maybe they're thinking about something else, but no one who is thinking about humanity in the perspective of a human would actually think this. You know, this is something that's being enacted on Uyghurs, on Kazakhs, on people of all ethnic backgrounds, mostly Muslim, you know, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, all of them, although there is not one Pawn person among the people being targeted in this way, and these are, actions are specially being taken against them. So people have closed their eyes. I, I can't say much other than that. Uh, I know I'm out of time, but I I, I wanted to say I I agree, um, and uh, and I know that it's not comfortable um, being being asked that question. Uh, but I think it is important that we do remind people that this is something that's real, that's happening, uh, and that our uh, inability to to recognize and hear um, people who are uh, bearing witness um, will allow for this atrocity to, to continue and this genocide to take place um, while the whole world watches. So thank you for your uh, bravery and thank you all for coming here today uh, and sh shedding light um, in into this. I yield back. Thank you so much. Um, well, unfortunately, it, it is time to close this hearing. I think often we uh, we're happy to end long hearings, but but this one, I'm sure I speak for all the members, uh, was particularly powerful and affecting for us all. Um, I want to thank uh, Chairman uh, Meeks for for his leadership in bringing us together today, uh, Ranking Member McCall for his partnership uh, with us on this issue uh, and in the defense of human rights around the world. And of course, to, uh, to all of our witnesses, particularly to, to Tursunay. Um, words like genocide and, and, and crimes against humanity are, are very powerful, but also somewhat abstract. And what we heard today was the personification of genocide and crimes against humanity. We heard what it actually means to the people who uh, who suffer it um, in, in the words through the voice of somebody uh, who managed to escape, but who left behind a country, um, a family, a people um, who are still suffering, which he just described. Um, we all, I think, recognize how difficult it is to deal with human rights abuses in a country like China. It's a superpower with nuclear weapons. We faced a similar challenge with the Soviet Union for many decades, but I think we all share the view that um, absolutely central to our contest with the Chinese government is establishing, not just for the United States and China, but for the world, the difference between right and wrong, the difference between what is true and what is false. Um, that's what this contest is all about. China wants to uh, establish a new set of rules in the world. The Chinese government wants to establish a new set of rules in the world in which what we heard today 
um, is either dismissed as right uh, or, um, or the world simply agrees not to care. And it is extraordinarily important to all of us, to all the people in the world, that the United States play its part in establishing this is wrong. Um, so we need an international coalition to do that. Uh, we want to work as a committee, as a Congress with the administration uh, to build that coalition and to make sure that our government has all the legal authorities that it needs to be able to play our part uh, in the work to come. So I know we're all committed to that on a bipartisan basis. We're grateful to all the witnesses for uh, giving us the, the information and the inspiration we need to do our work. Thank you again so much. Um, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you so Thank much, you. Congressman.